Okay, we're going to go ahead and start. Welcome to the uh, Joint Interim Standing Committee on Education. Um, this is our fourth meeting. And uh, first, let's start with the roll. So if Ms. Harper take the roll. Senator Buck. Senator Here. Senator Dondero Loop. Here. Vice Chair Bill Bray Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman Miller. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Chair Dennis. Here, thank you. And um, just to indicate that all committee members are present. Um, all right, and uh, before we begin, just the, the uh, typical reminders. Um, for those that are uh, here to provide testimony when speaking, identify yourself for the record each time you speak. Um, set your electronic devices to silent. Um, when testifying, you have to turn the microphone on. You just push it on and off each time you finish speaking. Um, the sign in on the tables as you come in at the, look, at the entrance of each of our locations. Um, even if you don't plan to testify, if you would sign in. Um, then um, meeting materials that were received prior to the meeting have been uploaded to the committee's webpage, um, and you can receive electronic notifications um, of the committee's agendas, minutes, final report by signing up at the Nevada Legislature's website. Um, and members, if you are attending via Zoom, keep your video turned on during the meeting to ensure we have a quorum. And then, um, and mute your microphone when, when not speaking to minimize background noise. Um, uh, finally, please note that during the committee meeting, the Zoom chat feature is only to be used for technical assistance from our broadcast and production service colleague. And uh, uh, I will, we will be taking a 30 minute uh, break for lunch at some point later in the morning, um, probably closer closer to noon around that time. Might maybe before, maybe after, but around that time. And I'll probably take a uh, I might take a, a mid morning break, just uh, like a really quick one. Uh, so with that, let's get started, and uh, we're going to start with public comment, um, item number two on our agenda. Um, Public comment may be provided in several ways, all of which are listed on the agenda in, in person, calling in, email, or written. Um, and uh, that information is available. Um, the call in numbers and those are, are on, on our website. Um, and please limit comment to three minutes per speaker. Um, an additional opportunity to give public comment will be available at the end of the meeting. Um, so, um, LCB Broadcast and Production Services uh, will interact with those making remote public comment and provide testimony to facilitate uh, participation in the meeting. So I will begin with those wishing to make public comment here in Las Vegas. So if anyone's here in Las Vegas who'd like to make comment, if you'd come forward. Yep, anywhere. And then just make sure you press the button. Good morning. It's good to see you. My name is Bill Hanlon. I'm a retired educator. Uh, I have a daughter who teaches. I have a granddaughter who works as teacher's aide who's becoming a teacher, and I have another granddaughter in high school. Uh, I'm here to talk about your contributions to failing schools. To be quite frank, no investment in teachers results, no investment in, in students. Our students, especially in Southern Nevada, are facing obstacles in trying to receive a good education. While some of those are clearly the fault of the local school district, others have their origin right here at the state legislature. That's occurring for a few reasons. First, the unintended consequences of your legislative actions resulted in our students not having their needs met. The second is the chronic underfunding in the areas of priority. And third is the state has been redirecting educational funding to your friends. Some examples. Nevada has had a documented teacher shortage, teach, uh, shortage of math teachers since 1985. That's over 35 years. While Nevada is hiring less and less qualified teachers who clearly need assistance, the state's professional development budgets have been cut by approximately 50% over the last decade and a half. And added to that, the administrators who evaluate and supervise those less than qualified teachers often know a lot less math and science than the substitutes 
of those teachers. How is that helping our students? If STEM is, in fact, a priority, how would you not be following this money to make sure that we're having good quality teachers? Now, the state and nation are facing an exacerbated teacher shortages. Shortages in all grade levels and subject areas. Students are being taught by good, hardworking substitutes. Is it possible that you are so naive that you don't understand when students don't have teachers that know their content or don't know how to deliver that content in understandable terms, this, this results in students acting out and being come, become frustrated, which adds to the discipline problems. Last session, with all those added federal dollars, you and the governor didn't bother to meet the needs of these teachers for professional development. These issues are ongoing in Nevada. Let me refresh your memory. When the new math and ELA standards were introduced, while the rest of the state received professional development funds to ensure teachers were aware of those new standards, the funds allocated for Southern Nevada, as you know, were diverted to the local university uh, by the governor and, and the then state superintendent to a senator's wife's program. Southern Nevada, which includes Clark, Esmeralda, Lincoln, and Mineral County, did not receive those funds, and then Governor Sandoval complained about the teachers not knowing the standards. I think you also need to invest in mirrors. And if that slight to Southern Nevada students was not enough, when the new science standards were introduced four years later, Southern Nevada, Clark, Esmeralda, Lincoln, Mineral Counties, again did not receive the funding. Nevada needs your commitment to STEM. Why do Southern Nevada students have these obstacles their education placed in front of them? And to improve the graduation rate, the district has imp imposed the minimum F standards and you did away with exams. Was that to show the graduation rate was not a sham, that, that it actually is? You also passed legislation to remove central administrators from uh, the administrative association. Those long-term Nevadans are now classified in that will and can be fired for no reasons. Have you noticed that no central administrators have spoken up about some of these policies that are causing strife in our schools? These people can't afford to disagree with the superintendent under the risk of being fired and have to leave the state to get another job. Mr. That Helen, silence. Mr. Helen, I need you to wrap up okay. we, and, and make sure you submit these so that we can yeah. get all these. That silence, to... about 30 more seconds. That silence is an unintended consequence of the legislation that has resulted in pretty poor policies. Central administrators need your protection. Uh, we do need to desolidate the Clark County School District. I, and I have this written out, so I'll stop right here. I would ask you, though, as legislators, while we have caused our own problems in the schools, you have exacerbated them by unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Anyone else wishing to give public comment here in Las Vegas? Not seeing anyone coming up. How about in Carson City? Anyone wishing to give public comment in Carson City? Doesn't look like anyone's coming forward. Uh, Chair, there's nobody coming there's forward. forward. Great, thank you very much. Um, let's go online. Anyone um, wishing to give public comment? Um, if uh, BPS could uh, put someone on, if we, if we have anyone on, if they would connect them. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to participate in public comment, please press the raise hand in your Zoom window or star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Caller, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. All right. Good morning, Chair Dennis and committee members. For the record, my name is Hava Ahmed, H-A-W-A-H-A-H-M-A-D, and I represent the Clark County Education Association. CCEA represents the over 18,000 licensed educators in bargaining with the Clark County School District, and we are the largest independent teachers association in the state and the country. In January 2022, CCEA commissioned two research institutions to create the Nevada Workforce Pipeline Asset Map Study. Phase one of the study will collect and examine workforce programs and provide legislative and regulatory recommendations to better align the pre-K through 20 educational delivery system certification requirements, and current and future industry needs to strategically diversify Nevada's economy. 
It is CCEA's hope that through a critical assessment of our strengths and gaps in Nevada's workforce development pipeline, we may better align every program to translate the successes from the programs we hear about today across the board. As CCEA works hard to ensure that the next legislature has research and recommendations to align the PK-320 educational delivery system with our current and future industry needs, we must reiterate the importance of the Commission of School Funding's recommendations to add an additional $200 million investment in our education system every year for eight additional years to reach the national average. However, to ensure that our dollars are invested and spent properly and on our students, we must address the learning environment and leadership at the top. CCEA is a community stakeholder that supports a hybrid model of governance with a majority of elected trustees and a minority of appointed trustees, much like the State Board of Education, to depoliticize education and make education students focused. Lastly, we must discuss the safety of our schools and our educators. It is no secret that violence against educators and violence in schools has escalated, and our biggest concerns about previous restorative practice bills has happened. We must work together to provide safety to our educators through legislative and regulatory changes that fund all schools with the resources necessary to improve our mental health programs for both our students and our teachers. CCEA appreciates the work and dedication of this committee, and we stand ready to assist in whatever way we can to bring our state forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go to the next caller. Chair, the public line is open and working. There are no additional callers at this time. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll go ahead and close public comment um, and go to our next item with item uh, agenda item number three, approval of the minutes for the meetings on February 16th and March 16th. Any? So moved. Okay. Um, before we do that, just any oh. questions or, or um, okay. So um, okay. So we don't have the March minutes. We only have the February ones. We've switched to a new um, uh, verbatim um, system. It's taking longer to get the minutes done. So we're only going to be doing uh, the February sixteenth. And I uh, does anyone have any corrections? If not, I will take a motion from someone. So from Senator Don Gerald Um Thank you. Do you have a second? Second. Okay, so you made the motion, so we're going to have a second from um, Sam Loom and uh, Bill Bray, Axelrod. Um, any further discussion? All in favor, say aye or raise aye. your hand. Any, any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. The, 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 uh, we will now go on to the next item, which is item, agenda item number four. Um, all right, we're going to go to item number four, presentation on current initiatives and challenges related to apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeship programs in Nevada and related updates. And we've got uh, several presenters here. Um, I know we have uh, Terry Reynolds, Director of the Department of Business and Industry, uh, Shannon Chambers, the La La Labor Commissioner, uh, Richard Williams, Director of State Apprenticeship Council. So welcome, and when you are ready, just um, make sure you, as you speak, um, and you go through and you change, uh, make sure you introduce yourself each time so we can keep the record straight, and then make sure you press the button. Thank you, Senator Dennis. Uh, Terry Reynolds, Director for the Department of Business and Industry. Uh, first, I wanted to take the time before we uh, get into the presentation to thank the legislative body for moving the Apprenticeship uh, Council, uh, the Apprenticeship Director over to the Department of Business and Industry within the Office of Labor Commissioner. So uh, it has been about a year, a little short of a year, um, since the uh, Legislative Act that moved the Commission um, or the, the Council back to, to uh, Business and Industry. With that, um, to my left is the Labor Commissioner Shannon Chambers, and to her left is Richard Williams, who's the State Apprenticeship Director. So with that, uh, we can get started in the presentation. So thank you. So good morning, Chair Dennis, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Very nice to see all of you in person and happy to be here. And thank you very much for the invitation to present today. For the record, my name is Shannon Chambers, Nevada Labor Commissioner. I've been the Labor Commissioner since 2014. And as Director Reynolds said, 
The Nevada State Apprenticeship Council is now back with the Office of the Labor Commissioner, so myself and Richard Williams, who is the State Apprenticeship Director, are going to give you an overview of what's kind of gone on um, in the past six to eight months since we have taken it back and where we think we're going, and happy to answer any questions and provide any additional feedback or information that you need at the end. So just to start, the Nevada Labor Commissioner and the Office of the Labor Commissioner has quite a few responsibilities. So we not only regulate private employment, but we also license private employment agencies, professional employer organizations, and we also have responsibility for public works projects. So we calculate prevailing wage on public works projects. Apprenticeship ties into public works projects because we enforce what's called the Apprenticeship Utilization Act, which requires a certain percentage of apprentices working on public works projects. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty, but essentially if you're working on a horizontal public works project, which is like a highway, it requires 3% apprentices working on that project. If you're working on a vertical project, means something being built going up. It requires 10% of apprentices to work on those projects. So apprenticeship has a direct tie to the Office of the Labor Commissioner and Public Works. So in terms of the State Apprenticeship Council, as Director Reynolds said, Assembly Bill 459 that was passed during the 2021 session moved the Nevada State Apprenticeship Council back to the Labor Commissioner. It was with the Labor Commissioner until 2017. During the 2017 session, it was moved to, at that time, what was called the Office of Workforce Innovation in the Governor's Office, which you now know as the Governor's Office of Workforce Innovation, so going. So that happened in 17, flash forward to 2021. Apprenticeship is moved back to the Labor Commissioner. So I'll kind of walk through of what we have done since then and also what the State Apprenticeship Director does and what the State Apprenticeship Council does. So the Nevada State Apprenticeship Council, it grew um, under the Labor Commissioner. Previously, there was seven members. In 2017, it grew to 11 members. And so I'll kind of run through, I know you have the presentation, but I'll run through who those members are and how they are appointed. They are appointed by the governor. So upon the recommendation of the Labor Commissioner, there are seven voting members, four non-voting members. So two of the members represent management and have a defined role in a jointly administered apprenticeship program. So two members from Northern Nevada that fit that definition, two members from Southern Nevada that meet that definition. There's two members that represent management who represent a labor, labor organization. Then there is one member from the general public. So I will tell you right up front, it is a pretty heavy council in terms of labor management, labor organization, union representation. Um, that is just a fact. The apprenticeship council has always been like that. One of the reasons for that is you have to have people who know what apprenticeship is and what it does. And so people who typically have been in the trades or have been in the unions and have been apprentices themselves are oftentimes the best representatives to have on the council. And I have the benefit of my state apprenticeship director was an active participant in apprenticeship and was an apprentice himself. So it makes perfect sense to have that type of a makeup for the council. So again, that is kind of the reality of the council. It is typically made up of members from the unions, from the trades, people who actually run apprenticeship programs. So the other four members are non-voting members. There is a member from the Governor's Office of Economic Development. There is a member from the Department of Education. And then there are two members from the Nevada System of Higher Education. One member is from a county of greater than 700,000, so that's going to be Clark County. The other member is a representative of a county that's less than 700,000, so that's typically going to be northern Nevada, the rural counties. So the council right now, we only have 10 members. We do not have a representative from southern Nevada. Um, from the Nevada System of Higher Education. 
and I'm sure you're all aware there have been some changes to the Nevada system of higher education. The chancellor just recently left, so we will have to see how that other um, council member gets appointed, but right now we have 10 members. So the council itself, and I also want to make this point very, very clear, under Nevada law, it is the Nevada State Apprenticeship Council that has the authority to approve registered apprenticeship programs. The labor commissioner cannot do that on my own. The state apprenticeship director cannot do that on his own. We work jointly with the council to review program standards, to discuss those programs, but essentially they are the body that can approve registered apprenticeship programs. So apprenticeship right now is a word that probably a lot of you are hearing all over. Um, there's a lot of money out there on the federal side for apprenticeship grants and expanding apprenticeship. But under Nevada law, apprenticeship has a very defined legal meaning, and all programs have to go before the Nevada State Apprenticeship Council. So Director Williams and myself were having these conversations day after day after day of we want to do apprenticeship, we want to do a program, what does it take, what does it require? So we walk them through the steps and we walk them through kind of the minimum requirements of what a program will require, what type of compliance you have to do, what the expectations are not only under federal law but state law. And again, I want to make this very, very clear. Apprenticeship is regulated by the Office of the Labor Commissioner. <laughs> we are the only entity in the state of Nevada that can approve an apprenticeship program through the Nevada State Apprenticeship Council. So again, there's a lot of activity out there, workforce training, workforce development. Apprenticeship is a very defined um, legal institution and has been for decades. And so one of the goals when we took back the Nevada State Apprenticeship Council was to make sure that we were providing the right information, not only to employers, but to interested individuals who were looking at apprenticeship. And as I say to a lot of people, and I'm going to say this today, it is not a gym membership. <laughs> you don't just sign up for 30 days and cancel any time. Apprenticeship is intended to be a long-term career path with wage progression at many, many stages, and then you hit what's called the journeyman level, and you go on to a career, and that journeyman certificate can be used to take to various employers, kind of like a college degree, um, to various you know, employers all over. But we've really tried to hit the reset button on apprenticeship since we take, to have taken this back. Because unfortunately, we just saw a lot of people out there trying to quote unquote start apprenticeship programs when they didn't re even realize that they have to go before a council, they're subject to audits, um, you, there's, there's laws, there's a lot of things to this and I am a huge supporter of apprenticeship just like Director Williams and I know Director Reynolds as well well, but we want to make sure that we do this right. So I really want to emphasize that today to this committee. We're really trying to do this right. And we've really started building relationships and working with the Department of Education and working with trades and working with non-union organizations as well to try and build some things from scratch. And so let me touch on the term pre-apprenticeship. So pre-apprenticeship is a term, again, that is out there. There is actually no legal definition for pre-apprenticeship. It's kind of a concept um, that has developed over the years in terms of apprenticeship. So the goal of pre-apprenticeship is you provide training to whether it's K through 12 students, whether it's displaced workers, whether it's you know adults who are seeking a career change, but you try and provide them with some of the basic education. So for example, OSHA training, so Occupational Safety Health Administration training. You try and provide them with basic construction education training, so reading building plans, um, basic algebra. So it's my view, and we've had these discussions with the Department of Education, that pre-apprenticeship really needs to start in K through 12. So I remember being a student um, a long time ago. 
I went to wood shop, I went to auto shop. <laughs> All those things, some of them are gone now. So again, pre-apprenticeship and you know, Director Williams and I have talked to a lot of you know, representatives from unions, non-unions, the schools. You know, that definite shift to STEM um, was a good thing, but kind of on the other side of that was CTE, so construction technical education. So trying to build that back into the school system. And we actually have developed a plan, both in Northern Nevada and Southern Nevada, to try and get some of those programs back into K through 12 and what that will do, what we think it can do, especially in light of the infrastructure bill that was approved um, at the national level that's gonna bring over $400 million to the state of Nevada. But we need a pipeline of workers starting now in K through 12, because one of the issues with apprenticeship is that unfortunately in a lot of the construction trades, a lot of workers at a certain age level are retiring and those ranks are not being filled as quickly as they used to be, and that's just a fact, and Director Williams can speak more to that, but we really need to get back to developing that pipeline through the K through 12 schools with an entry into an apprenticeship program. And so, again, we're working on that, but right now, and I'm just gonna be very, very honest with you, um, there is no standard pre-apprenticeship program in the state of Nevada. Um, it's something that we, again, are talking about, trying to work on, but as of right now, it doesn't really exist. So want to make that very, very clear. The other issue here, and you know, um, <laughs> probably don't want to come right out and say it, is traditionally apprenticeship outside of the federal grants. The Office of the Labor Commissioner has not received any additional funding to support apprenticeship. Um, there typically has not been any state money beyond the per diem for the council members, but as of right now, there is not a budget, quote unquote, to expand apprenticeship for the labor commissioner from state funding. So again, just pointing that out, that's a reality. Um, again, a lot of federal money out there, a lot of grants, and we are working through a lot of those grants to make sure that they are the right fit but traditionally apprenticeship has not been funded um, at the state level. So just wanna make that very, very clear. So kind of getting back to how the structure works. So under the federal law and under state law, we act as the state apprenticeship agency for the state of Nevada. That means again that all programs have to go through the Office of the Labor Commissioner and the Nevada State Apprenticeship Council. There's not a workaround where you can work around the council. So previously, and um, I'll point this out as we get towards the end of the presentation, previously what was happening was there were entities and employers that said, I don't wanna go before the council. <laughs> I don't wanna have to sit up in front of the council and answer all those questions. So they went directly around to the federal government and some programs got approved that never got approved at the state level. So we have stopped that um, effective July 1st, 2021, and are enforcing state law, meaning again, all programs have to go through the Nevada State Apprenticeship Council. Otherwise, they are not legal. And so I can tell you, as the labor commissioner, who is a regulator by trade, I was shocked to find out <laughs> that that was going on and that there were programs that were not approved at the state level. And so we definitely took action and put a stop to that. But as of now, the message, again, all programs have to go th before the State Apprenticeship Council. So that's been pretty effective, I think, so far. And just to kind of give you another idea of kind of what we've done um, in terms of action. So thankfully, Senator Don Darrow Loop sponsored Senate Bill 247, which established the authority for the council to set a minimum wage for non-construction apprentices. So we took that action in November of 2021, and we set a minimum wage for non-construction apprentices of $14.50 an hour. 
So some of you may think that's low. <laughs> some may think that's high. Um, I can tell you, again, just kind of taking this back and seeing kind of some things, there were apprenticeship programs with starting wages of $11 an hour. Um, and given the current employment environment where you can drive around and there are various entities offering $18, $19 an hour plus benefits plus vacation, um, 11 or even $14.50 an hour may not be that attractive. And that is one of the challenges too with apprentices is apprentices are intended to move up a scale of wages. So if you have a one year apprenticeship program that's $14.50 with no wage progression, and on top of that, the apprentice has to take classes and they have to do required training, there are some individuals who just say, I'd rather just go get a job. And um, again, that's a challenge and we're working through that with the trades and with employers and a lot of different people like that. But it is, it is a tough employment market in general. And so fortunately, most employers on their own have gone way above the $14.50. That's just a minimum. Um, our hope is that each year the council will continue to move that wage up and up and up. So again, $14.15, $14.50, sorry, starting wage for a non-construction apprentice. We also set a construction wage for apprentices, so that's currently $14.63 an hour. Um, those typically are non-union construction programs that will go up in August um, to, what, $15.42 an, an hour. So again, we're trying to, trying to meet the market is the best way I can say it, but quite frankly, from talking to a lot of the apprenticeship programs, they are still having a turnover rate of anywhere between 40 to 50% of apprentices who start and don't finish. And part of that challenge is the wage issue. Part of that challenge is some of the wraparound services, um, again, that go hand in hand with education. So childcare, transportation, um, things as simple as buying boots or buying a tool belt. Um, again, the funding that's not there for some of these things is a reality. And so to the credit of a lot of the apprenticeship programs, they fund a lot of this stuff on their own, which is good. But Director Williams and I definitely see the need for probably some additional funding that needs to be put towards helping individuals and especially women, and I'm just gonna come out and say it, <laughs> um, women in the trades, and we actually, about a month and a half ago, it was um, National Women's Day in Apprenticeship, and so we had representatives from the United States Department of Labor come, and we met with the Apprentice of the Year, who happened to be female, um, a female electrician, but just talking about basic things, for example, of separate bathrooms on a construction site, um, you know, a nursing station on a construction site. So again, just some of those basic issues, but as of right now, there is just not the funding to support those wraparound services, not just for women, but also for men and for individuals who may come from different backgrounds and different things like that. So we're working on that. Again, trying to take advantage of that federal money that's quote unquote out there but some of that federal money definitely has restrictions and want to make sure that we utilize it correctly and are accountable for it. Um, so that's you know one of the things we're definitely working on. So kind of back to some additional things that we have done since we took back the State Apprenticeship Council. So we have registered two new programs. So both of those programs were software developer programs, so in information technology. So that is a very, very good thing. Um, and we're moving in the right direction. And the comment that I get all the time is, well, apprenticeship is just construction. Well, it's not. <laughs> Again, if it's done right, it can be any, any number of things. It can be healthcare, it can be IT, it can be education, but it just has to meet the law and it has to meet the requirements and we need employers. <laughs> and those are some key components. So when we took back the Apprenticeship Council, again, we started looking at some programs that were approved in 1718. 
we found out that there was over 32 programs that had never ever registered or indentured a single apprentice. So we canceled 32 programs, um, canceled, suspended them. Um, that's not something I like to say as the labor commissioner saying we're expanding apprenticeship when we've had to cancel 32 of them. But the reality was is these were 32 programs that somehow got approved that never ever registered an apprentice, that never had an employer. And I can tell you, <laughs> you have to have an employer, <laughs> you have to have an apprentice to be an apprenticeship program. So clean up, clean up, and we've done that. Now it's time to move forward. Um, again, there might be some additional cleanup. In the past four years, we know that there were no audits or compliance reviews done of existing apprenticeship programs. So that is another requirement under the law is that you have to do compliance reviews and make sure programs are doing what they're doing. So we are starting to do that now. Um, to make sure that everybody's operating under the same standards under Nevada Revised Statute 610 and Nevada Administrative Code 610. So we are in the process of developing a plan on that. On the other good side though, we are talking about apprenticeship programs in trucking. We are talking about apprenticeship programs again in the IT fields. I've had conversations with the hospital association, with the nursing board, with the dental board to really try and expand in those areas as well. Um, one of my concerns, and I know Director Williams shares that, is we want to make sure that any apprenticeship program, especially in healthcare, meets the standards of the board and is a, is a growth pattern. I mean, you are always gonna have those individuals who maybe just wanna do a one-year certified nursing assistant program, but the goal would be if there's something, once they get that CNA, can they move on to something else, eventually maybe move up to a nurse. Um, so to the credit of the hospitals and the hospital association, a lot of those entities are doing it on their own but we want to make sure that we can partner with them in the areas that we can. And again, expand, expand apprenticeship when it makes sense. And I, again, I'm just going to say that <laughs> because in some situations it doesn't make sense. In some situations it's just workforce training and I'm all in favor of that um, and I think that's a great thing. But if you're going to do apprenticeship, it does have to make sure that it meets the requirements of the law and has an employer, has an apprentice, and that you know you're gonna be subject to compliance reviews, subject to reporting, and subject to all of those things that make a program um, successful. So I'm gonna to defer to Director um, Williams here for a minute to kind of talk about what are the general requirements of apprenticeship and then kind of to go over some of the apprenticeship numbers right now as they stand and the number of apprentices in the state of Nevada. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Richard Williams, State Apprenticeship Director. I'm happy to be here. And I, again, as uh, the Commissioner stated, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to come in and speak to you today. So um, I wanted to give a few uh, numbers here for everyone so you understand the apprenticeship system a little bit better in Nevada. So currently we have 65 registered sponsors uh, that have apprenticeship programs here in the State of Nevada which equates to 5,735 active apprentices in Nevada. That number changes daily depending on completion rates and how the economy goes, quite frankly. Uh, there was a time that was just a few months ago was a little over 6,000, but a lot of the apprentices uh, have completed since then. And the programs are starting to ramp up again from the numbers I see. There's a lot of new applications coming in, so that's very positive. Um, along with those numbers, there's 745 Nevada employers that utilize apprentices, so um, we're always looking to expand that number as well, and I know the different programs are always out soliciting employers to join their programs as well, so that's a good number. And there are 75 uh, different occupations that are uh, uh, recognized by the DOL and our state apprenticeship agency as active occupations as well. So one thing I just wanted to touch on what the commissioner stated before. So um, when apprentices do start a program, there is a high turnover rate in the very beginning. Uh, some apprentices get into programs, they thought maybe they liked it, maybe they didn't, and they drop out. But I do want to say after talking to a lot of the programs, and this is very important, 
After the first year, if an apprentice makes it through the first year, there's over a 90% completion rate for those apprentices when they continue and they journey out. So the first year is kind of, a, I like to call it like a weeding out period. Sometimes it's not for everybody and, uh, and they kind of just part ways, but there is a high success rate when they do go into the second year and continue their apprenticeship. So, um, and just some other stats I'd like to throw out there too, just for everybody's benefit. So, out of that 5,735 um, active apprentices currently, there are 5,398 uh, are male, 297 are female, and there are 40 that uh, didn't provide um, their gender on the application. So as the commissioner said, we, as those numbers you know, reflect, there's definitely a need to increase uh, participation for females, and we're always looking to expand that. And, um, you know, we could certainly use some help on that as well, um, as the commissioner stated through the legislative process, with maybe some funding to help incentivize our programs to do that and to help them market that type of thing. So, and with the other issues that she spoke about, um, you know, with the different, you know, things that the women have trouble with on job sites and different employers, I think that needs to be addressed. It's very important, and uh, I think we can get there. We just need everybody's a commitment to do that. Um, so I do have some other numbers I'd like to run through too by ethnic group. So out of that um, active apprentice number, we have 2,556 Hispanic, 2,785 are non-Hispanic, and 394 did not provide their uh, ethnicity on the applications. And I like numbers, as you can see, I kind of break everything down. So by race, um, there are 415 uh, black, 158 uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, 151 Asian, 176 Hawaiian Pacific Islander, uh, 3,561 white, 71, or I'm sorry, 79 as multi-race, and 1,195 did not provide their uh, race on the application. And just by that number alone, you can see we, we need to expand diversity as well. Uh, there's certainly um, room to improve there as those numbers kind of speak for themselves. So that's also very important, not only to myself and the commissioner, and, uh, but to these programs as well. They struggle to find diversity and to find people to come into their programs. It's not for lack of trying, they, they are trying. And uh, we certainly would like to see a little uh, you know, a big improvement on that as well. Uh, and here are some of the numbers that I, I always like. Uh, so by veteran, um, there are 455 veterans that are registered apprentices in the uh, state of Nevada. There are 5,200 that are non-veterans and 78 uh, did not provide their veteran status. And lastly on the stats, this is one of my favorite uh, numbers that I like to look at. So by age, 16 through 24, there are 2,183, uh, 25 through 34, 2,460, and 35 and over, uh, 1,092. So the reason I like that number is because it shows that there's a younger generation of Nevadans that are getting into the apprenticeship programs to come up behind the journeymen that are um, journeying out and retiring. So those numbers, I always like to see those higher, and I always commend the um, the programs themselves, when I have an opportunity to talk to them, I pat them on the back and say, good job, because you need to recruit that next young workforce to come up behind everybody. And as the commissioner stated earlier, you know, K through 12 is important, very important for a pre-apprenticeship program to start somewhat in there. Maybe it's not called pre-apprenticeship, but when I came up um, many years ago, uh, I had, uh, wood shop and metal shop. That's what got me involved in the trade. And that's what got me involved in the carpenters union. And I started that apprenticeship, journeyed out, and here I am today. I mean, that's, we need to have that for the, the kids in the schools. I think we've lost a, a big generation of people that didn't have the exposure to trades and or apprenticeship because of various reasons that it's just not available to them. And I think that's unfortunate because I think there's a big generation of people that maybe college wasn't for them. 
you know, but here's an avenue where you can make upwards of six figures without a college education. And I think that's important. Um, you know, and then kind of piggyback on, on that, the programs are part of here in Southern Nevada, they're part of um, a program where they get college credit at CSN for the curriculum that they um, complete in the registered programs, they get college credits towards an associate's degree in the community college, which is something I utilized. And a lot of apprentices do, and that helped me get a bachelor's degree. So there's definitely a pipeline for, through education, through apprenticeship. And I think that piece is lost a lot, and it's not talked about a lot, and it needs to be, because it's very important, not only for our economy, but for Nevadans. We're talking about people's families. We're talking about real people. And I put that message out there as much as I can because it's important. It's affecting people's lives. Like, you know, and just to kind of close out what the commissioner said, apprenticeship is the gold standard of workforce development in this country and in Nevada. And it shouldn't be taken lightly by anybody. You know, and unfortunately it has been, which is why a lot of programs were canceled. They were approved somehow and there wasn't any follow-up to make sure that the kids that were thought they were getting education or these employers were going to help you know people in our state there wasn't any thought about that afterwards when they were signed up and that's unfortunate and we need to stop that and we have and we're continuing to do it and uh, you know we hope apprenticeship leads to a career path for people that you know you can support a family of four and get out of that poverty level and as it's going up constantly and it's important to our economy. And on the other end, it's important to our tax base too. The more people make, the more they spend, taxes roll in that way too. So um, well again, I thank you for your time and if there's any questions, uh, certainly um, would like to answer them as best as I can. But thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Um, so is that your presentation? Chair Dennis, just very quickly, just to run through. So typically, apprenticeship is 2,000 hours of training. And typically, it, it allows for 16-year-olds, but typically, they're 18-year-olds. And I'll tell you the reason why. It starts with an I, and it's insurance. <laughs> so if you're an employer, you know, typically, apprentice, apprenticeship, you want um, good insurance um, coverage. And a lot of companies won't write insurance for apprenticeships, especially in construction, if they're under 18. So just to kind of point that out, Senate Bill 247, again, that was sponsored by Senator Don Darrow Loop, did provide some additional flexibility. So we now have time-based, which is construction, so that's that 2,000 hours, and construction has to be time-based because you have to learn how to do that craft and that trade. We have a competency-based approach to apprenticeship now, too, which is typically your information technology because you have to be competent, and that typically doesn't require you out banging nails and doing things like that. You're on a computer doing those types of things. We now also have a hybrid approach, so you can mix and match. Um, um, but there still has to be a basic level of training and education that has to take place, and that's typically 144 hours. So again, this model does work, um, but we need to make sure that we do it right and tie it into K through 12, tie it into the community colleges, and have those employers who really want to get into this and are willing to take on um, that responsibility, and we're here to help them. And I just want to say thank you very much for your time and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And just for the record, that was Shannon Chambers, the Library Commissioner, on those last comments. Correct. Apologize, sir. It's all right. I just want to make sure on the record it's clear. Um, thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. I know we have a few questions. Um, we're going to start out first with uh, some, uh, my Vice Chair, uh, Assemblywoman Bill Barry Axelrod. Thank you for the presentation. I'll, I'll try to keep my um, questions brief because I have this many. <laughs> um, so maybe we can go offline and, and have discussions because this is one of the things that I think is probably the most important um, for our state. Um, you kind of mentioned it. We want people to have great jobs with benefits and and taxpayers and you know that that's what we need, right? That's we're the education committee. That's how we fund education. 
So um, the first thing you said I'm going to jump on is that we don't have a Southern Nevada representative or an NC representative. I did kind of, while you were talking, I was going on the website. It's a little hard to navigate. Um, I was kind of wishing that the board members would, you could be able to see the bio or something. Of So I was kind of Googling a couple of people. It's Cheryl Olson is on there from NC. Is she no longer on the... So for the record, again, Shannon Chambers Labor, that's the Northern Nevada representative. Okay. That's okay. not the Southern Nevada I gotcha. representative. I got you. And I did see... Okay. Okay. So let, we're going to talk offline because that needs to be fixed immediately. We've got a lot of great projects down here. We have a lot of need. Um, I liked that you talked about nursing. And even when you were talking about teachers and... Um, I know my daughter's at LVA, and one of her favorite classes last semester was careers. And, right. and he was a great teacher and talked about all different paths, right? Um, the carpenters do a great job. I went into their training facility, and I, I, I was, like, ready to quit my job and become, like, a carpenter. It was so cool. So um, congratulations on that. I just think we need to be doing more, more, more. So let me get to my question. <laughs> um, you said that people were not going through your office and going uh, straight to the feds, and you put the kibosh on that and pulled it back. I'm wondering, are you working with congressional offices? So when people reach out to them, I know when I worked for Congresswoman Titus, people were constantly looking for things like this, apprenticeship programs. And Do they know to lead people to you? Um, I think that would be a natural um, alliance right there, that it's a win-win both for the congressional office as well as you guys bringing people. And I'm not just talking about folks who want to be apprentices. I'm talking about businesses who would like to get into this area as well. Um, we all know hiring is tough, super tough. You were saying you could make... I, my daughter, her first job, she wants to work at In-N-Out, and I think they're starting at $18 an hour. You know, So this is what you're competing against. So um, have you worked with congressional offices? So again, uh, for the record, Shannon Chambers, Nevada Labor Commissioner, we have. So the plan that we put together for kind of an apprentice construction technical education in Southern Nevada and Northern Nevada, we did work with Senator Cortez Masto's office, Senator Rosen, um, not so much as to the congressional level, I'll be very honest, but again, we've been reaching out as much as we can, but I think your point is absolutely a good one, and we will double down on those efforts, um, but I will tell you that in those conversations between Senator Cortez Masto and Senator Rosen, they are definitely directing people to our way. And, and, and they're great, and that's fantastic, but I do think if you drill down to the congressional level, if you look at Congresswoman Titus's office or uh, Congressman Horsford's or Amity, I think you might, it's a little more specific instead of statewide. They have a, obviously a little bit more of a focus, so I just think that that would be a really great, and I'm happy once again to talk to you offline. My last question I mean, that I'm going to ask today. <laughs> you have to promise to follow up with me, though, okay? <laughs> Your um, name is Shannon, so there's yeah, no I know, way I right? It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the 2,000 hours, is that a 40-hour week? So is that like their apprentice is done usually typically in 50 weeks, if I'm doing the math correct? Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, Richard Williams, for the record. So the 2,000 hours is required by the DOL for a program. They're typically done in a year, but it depends on, you know, economic reasons and the, uh, the work hours that, you know, that apprentice can do. But that's ideal is that yes. you go, you'll, you'll knock this out in just under a year. Yes. Okay. Um, that's all I'll ask for now. But you promise, Shannon. <laughs> Thanks. I'm good for it. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I just want to clarify, when you mentioned that the Southern Nevada represent, that's just one person or is it two people? It's two, for, again, for the record, Shannon Chambers, Nevada Labor Commissioner, it's two representatives from Nevada System of Higher Education. One is from a county that's over 700,000. One is under, so that's typically northern Nevada, so that's um, Cheryl Olson that the vice chair referenced. There currently is no representative for basically over a 700,000 population county, which is basically Clark County, although I will tell you that Washoe County is tipping close to being over 700,000 here pretty close. I would never recommend to the governor, and I'm saying this on the record, that you would not have a representative from Southern Nevada on the State Apprenticeship Council. Right. So, but the vacancy is only one. It's one only vac one. One vacancy. Yep. Okay. Thank yep. you. All right. Other questions? Oh, yes. Um, Assemblywoman Miller, and then we'll go to 
Dr. Lu. Thank you, Chair Dennis, and thank you for the presentation. I, um, as an educator, I will speak for many teachers in just reminding folks that teachers were not the ones that took this out of the schools, <laughs> and, nor were we the ones that felt that the pendulum had to swing to just pushing college, you know, and not offering all the different pathways for our students with their interests and their aptitudes and their desires. Uh, but my question, I'm going to shift actually to veterans. And I know that each apprenticeship program has their you know, own requirements and standards, but since you're here, I thought I'd ask a more higher level generalized question. We often have veterans coming in after service who actually have had, though, have been doing those same types of jobs while they were in uh, active duty service. And so, and then coming out, but now in the civilian world, it, so my question is, is there any type of reciprocity that's given or considerations if, I mean, we, we see this even in the medical field. So when it comes to veterans who are coming out with those job skills and experience that they did while serving to what kind of reciprocity or programs or accelerations do we have for them when they come back into um, the apprenticeship programs? Sure. You know, thank you for that question. Richard Williams, for the record. So most of the programs, if not all, are members of what's called Helmets to Hard Hats. And they get direct entry into the programs. And, you know, to your point, a lot of those, especially in the Navy, the CBs, they'll come out and they have construction background. And all the standards in Nevada allow for, uh, it's not called reciprocity, but it's they give them credit for past service uh, in that skill. So maybe that CB that maybe was a carpenter, say, uh, he would get uh, that, or he or she would get um, preference, you know, for the application process and probably would be awarded a second year. They would give first year credit, bring that person in as a second year. But Helmets to Hard Hats, I believe all the apprenticeship programs utilize that, and that's a direct entry into the apprenticeship programs. Uh, they just have to provide a DD-214, I believe it is, and they get direct entry into the apprenticeship programs, providing that they're taking applications and there's you know, somewhere for them to go. Um, it was a little tricky during COVID, but they were still bringing in people at that time as well. Hope that answers your question. Follow-up, Chair? Yeah, go ahead. I, I think my specific question is not just for entry, but acceleration through the program. Is there anything that provides for acceleration? You talked about giving the one year or entering the second status. Does that mean that that veteran can actually complete their apprenticeship program, be on to journeyman quicker? Yeah, so, sorry, I, I misunderstood what you're asking. Richard Williams again, yes. So I'd say a four-year program, if that person came in and did have a year or two prior experience in the service in the construction field, that JTC could award them credit for that. And then that person would only need to finish two more years to attain that journeyman certificate. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and it happens a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Simum and Hardy, just because I see you online, do you have any questions? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, so you talk a little bit about the the wages that you quoted. Um, so, are you? Is there an average of like if you're in an apprenticeship program, how many hours they're able to work that they're being paid? Does it vary by program? You know, are they working like 20 hours, 40 hours? You could just kind of give me an idea about that. Sure, thanks for the question. Richard Williams again for the record. So each program is different depending on the occupation. Just in, as an example, an electrician would be an 8,000 hour program. And as they progress through that program, they would get step increases as they complete on the job hours and you know RTI classroom hours. So they would progress. Uh, through that program like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. So I'm, I'm trying to okay. figure out if they're, so are they getting paid, you know, like fourteen fifty an hour or like a 40 hour work or just, you know, I'm trying to figure out how much week kind of they're, they're getting paid for. So for the record, Shannon Chambers, Nevada Labor Commissioner. So 
apprenticeship, there's an approved pay scale as an apprentice moves up and goes along. So typically if they're in a one year program making $14.50, depending upon the employer, they may be working 20 hours, they may be working 40 hours, they could potentially work overtime. But that pay kind of approved pay scale is locked in and approved by the council. The whole goal of the apprenticeship idea is that they go from one year to the second year to the third year, so they may be making 14.50 or 40 percent of what a journeyman makes, but by year three, they're making 70 percent. So that is the goal. Um, again, one of the issues here too is you have to have that employer who has jobs, who has the hours, so that that apprentice can get that training and get that work. But you know, I will tell you the construction environment right now, there are apprentices who are working <laughs> in some cases 60, 70 hours a week because the need is just there. Okay, yeah, that's what I was looking for, just clarification and um, so that answers my question. Um, and that's good to know that there are, there are jobs and they are yeah. able to work um, possibly full-time hours with some of these apprenticeship programs. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Assemblyman and Thomas, you have a question. Thank you, Chair Dennis. And thank you for the presentation. Um, my question actually has to do with uh, the female and minority question that you posed here. How can the legislators assist in um, gaining more female minority workers or apprentices? Um, is there a program that you have um, that we could you know, uh, put forward, um, how can um, the state government help? So thank you for the question again, Shannon Chambers, for the record. So I think it needs to be a combination of things. There are apprenticeship programs who reach out to the various community organizations who reach out to the urban chamber, who identify employers and schools where there may be underserved populations. So there are currently programs that are doing that now. One of the issues with apprenticeship is for an employer to do this, especially if they haven't done it before, the administrative costs and helping them do the paperwork and that type of a thing. I think that's one area where if you had minority owned businesses who know that community and can tap into that pool, if they had potential funding to help them, even if it's getting started that first year or that second year, and those wraparound services, childcare, transportation, um, you know, whether it's tuition assistance, different things like that. We are talking to the school districts and trying to focus on schools where we know there is an underserved population and minority groups and female groups. That progress, again, I'm not going to tell you that's going to happen overnight, but we are trying. But I think from, again, in my opinion, from a legislative perspective, it has to be funding for those wraparound services because a lot of these individuals, child care alone, it's it's literally for some individuals I've talked to, it's not even worth it for them because child care is $1,000 a month. So those types of things, and I'm more than happy, you know, director, to have that conversation offline too, but you know, it's just one of those things where just the basic foundation of getting someone to work each day and providing them support, there is just not a basket of money there right now for that. All right, thank you. So um, follow up, please. Yeah, go ahead. So um, the gist of all of this is that in order to get that word out to females and minority groups, we need funding. That uh, apparently is not there right now. So again, for the record, Shannon Chambers, Labor Commissioner, I think that's part of it. I think back to the K through 12 perspective is notifying individuals at all levels in all schools and all shapes and sizes and colors that apprenticeship is an option and this is a pathway that you can do it and this is what's here to help you. I think it, it 
money's part of it, but there has to be an effort in the K through 12 to notify those individuals that these programs and apprenticeship and a potential career path exists. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Terry Reynolds, let me, Director for uh, Business and Industry, I'll be very quick, but uh, we have a lot of resources that we're now uh, looking at putting into uh, the effort of building our labor force uh, within the state of Nevada. Uh, child care is, is a huge uh, issue because uh, during the pandemic, we lost 50% or more of our child care providers. So we're building back up and trying to um, look at voucher systems, to look at uh, support to be able to build our, um, the child care network, to be able to provide child care for our workers. It is in, it is in dire need uh, to do that. Uh, fortunately, um, we also have the Minority Affairs Commission uh, within business and industry, within the director's office in Southern Nevada. And we are using them to, as an educational source, to get out to groups and speak, uh, to talk about what the needs are within our different communities within the state. Uh, education, getting people to understand the problem. Uh, and then we can start building solutions uh, when they better understand those problems. So we have a lot of work to do in that area, but we are working on it uh, and trying to build the bridges to be able to get our workers um, uh, with wraparound services so they can get back into the workforce. That's the issue we really have today. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Simon um, Hansen in, in Carson City, do you have any questions? No, thank you very much. All right, thank you. I just have a run really quick. Um, is there an easy way to get, a, I mean, if someone wants to know all of the different apprenticeship programs that are available, is there like a list that you publish that's easy, that people can get to? Yeah, Richard Williams, uh, State Apprenticeship Director for the record. Yes, so on our website, the Labor Commissioner's website, it would be uh, labor.nv.gov. Under, there, there's a drop-down tab there. It's called NSAC, which stands for Nevada State Apprenticeship Council. Under that drop-down tab, there is a listing to the right of all the um, approved registered programs with occupations and the contact information for each program. So that, that's that been available to the public uh, for okay. a long time. So what I would recommend, because I saw, I, I looked at that earlier, what I would recommend is you maybe put a special little button or something that says, because I mean, if somebody's just going and wants to know about apprenticeships, they're not going to know to look under NSAC. Okay. But, well. Because I duly noted, yeah. Because I think I think that one of the things that we're hearing, you know, is that yep. you know we could do a better job at telling people, hey, this is available, um, but we just want to make it easy for them to, to be able to get to the information when you know. So no, thank you for that. It's a work in progress in my head right. anyway. So yeah, absolutely, love yeah. the input. I appreciate I'll it. Take thank, note you of that. For, thank you. Thank you for all the great work that you're doing. Thank you for your, your presentation today, um, and uh, I, I'm sure. Um, now we know who, if we need to, we can reach out to you. So anybody that has any additional questions or whatever, just please feel free to, to reach out to them. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Great. We'll, thank you very much. Thank you. In order to keep us going here, because I think we're going to lose a few of our people at some point, um, uh, some of our presenters. So I want to make sure we get to these. And uh, the next item is item agenda item number five, a presentation on current initiatives and challenges relating to apprenticeships, pre-apprenticeships, and other work-based learning programs in Nevada. So when you guys are ready, if you'll come forward and uh, introduce anybody that's going to be doing the uh, presentation. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Dennis, Vice Chair Bilberry Axelrod, and honorable, honorable members of the committee. I'm Jessica Todman. For the record, I'm the Deputy Superintendent for Educator Effectiveness and Family Engagement at the Nevada Department of Education. In that capacity, my portfolio includes the Office of Career Readiness, Adult Learning and Education Options, which we refer to as CRALEO. The CRALEO team oversees career and technical education as well as work-based learning, and we will be presenting on both of those topics today. We appreciate Commissioner Chamber and her team for their presentation to start us off today, and I'm happy to bring to the table in the north Craig Satuki, who oversees the CRALEO office and will provide an update on work-based learning in Nevada K-12 schools. 
As I like to say, while all apprenticeships are work-based learning, not all work-based learning are apprenticeships. And so we're happy to provide a comprehensive update on that topic, including information on some of the challenges that K-12 students face in accessing registered apprenticeship. Craig also serves as the Nevada Department of Education's representative to the State Apprenticeship Council. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Craig Satuki in the north. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Dennis and the members of the Legislative Committee on Education. For the record, I am Craig Satuki, the Director of the Office of Career Readiness, Adult Learning and Education Options for the Nevada Department of Education. And I'll be providing you an update on apprenticeships and work-based learning this morning. Work-based learning is an educational strategy that offers students the opportunity to connect classroom learning with, to authentic business and industry experience. Work-based learning in Nevada is described as a continuum of experiences that help prepare students for post-secondary education and careers. The goal of work-based learning is to assist students to be college and career ready through authentic connections through business and industry in a field related to the student's career interest. For the purposes of collecting work-based learning data that was reported to the State Board of Education and the Legislature in January of odd number of years, our offices, school districts, and public charter schools focus on career preparation and career training activities. As part of the department's previous work with the Governor's Office of Workforce Innovation, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, Department of Employment, Training and Rehabilitation, and the Nevada System of Higher Education with the New Skills for Youth Grant and the LifeWorks Project, we worked to, to, to create these definitions to ensure that all agencies were working with common language around apprenticeships. As you can see from these definitions, the implementation of pre-apprenticeship and registered apprenticeships within high schools is significantly restricted due to age and, and, and education requirements. And as Commissioner Chamber mentioned in the previous presentation, um, those definitions we utilize, while, they, while we don't necessarily have a hard definition, these are the definitions that we provide school districts and charter schools so that when they are communicating with their, with their educators or students and their families, that, the, that we are talking the same language across the state. And I think that's very important as, as we move forward. I won't rehash too much of this because I believe Commissioner Chambers did, did cover this in her presentation. But any development of new apprenticeships does need to submit an application in alignment with NRS and NAC 610 and receive approval from the State Apprenticeship Council. There are opportunities for apprenticeships and we are, and we are starting to see those now. Uh, TMCC, the Reno Orthopedic Center Foundation and the Washoe County School District are currently partnering to provide a certified nursing youth Certified Nursing Assistant Youth Apprenticeship Program for Washoe County School District students over the age of 16 with their first cohort start, starting this summer. This opportunity is not limited to CTE students and provides an excellent opportunity for students to participate in an apprenticeship program, earn an industry-recognized credential, and start the students on a career pathway that is in demand in, in Nevada. Due to improvements in data collection methods from the department, we are unable to provide comparable data work-based learning prior to 2019-2020. As you can see uh, from this chart, COVID-19 had a significant impact on student participation in 2020-21. In addition, school building closures and other COVID-19 related cancellations could have impacted the number of students participating in work-based learning during the second semester of 2019-2020. Almost all career preparation and career training work-based learning activities experienced a significant decline in student participation uh, between 2019 and 2020. And as you notice, there are a couple areas in which we have seen improvement. And as we are improving our technical assistance to school districts and the school districts are implementing their work-based learning plans, we are seeing increases particularly in CTE work experience and uh, supervised agricultural experiences because of, the, of that technical assistance in schools, properly including those students into work-based learning activities. Due to the low numbers of students participating in work-based learning in some special populations, we have not included this, that information in this chart. Uh, in the next presentation, which I believe is item agenda six, I'll provide a comparison of CTE enrollment to statewide enrollment, but overall CTE enrollment it relatively mirrors the statewide enrollment. For, for students 9 through 12. The department believes that the removal of restricting language requiring students to be participating in CTE in order to participate in work-based learning as passed by Assembly Bill 38 in the last legislative session will provide opportunities for students who are interested in career pathways that are not offered at their individual school. 
In the next pr presentation, I'll provide additional details, but right now our office is currently facilitating a restructuring of most of our CT programs of study to two-year sequences, which we, we believe will provide students, schools, and school districts the flexibility to provide additional work-based learning opportunities for their CTE students and provide additional possibilities for youth apprenticeships similar to what we're seeing with a certified nursing youth assistant youth apprenticeship program being coordinated by the Nevada System of Higher Education. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak about apprenticeships and work-based learning this morning. I'm available for any questions or comments. Thank you. Okay, and before we do questions, I'm, um, we're, we also have a presentation from uh, the, the, the Superintendent Association, and uh, so if we could do that, and then we'll go to questions to, since they're, they're all on the same topic. And I, who do we? Uh, Go ahead. There, uh, Superintendent Summer Stevens. Yes, go Can ahead. You hear me? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Summer Stevens, for the record. I'm feeling like I have some feedback. Uh, hello, Superintendent Summer Stevens, Churchill County, uh, also the president of the Nevada Association of School Superintendents. Also with me today, I have Superintendent Pam Teal from Lincoln County, um, and I also have uh, Dr. Mike Barton from Clark County School District. And so um, uh, in this particular part of the presentation, I'm, I'll pull that up. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the, the legislation that uh, that Craig just spoke about and uh, turn it over to Pam, who's going to speak a little bit about work-based learning and um, also then um, if if Dr. Barton has anything to add. So let me go ahead and, and share my screen here just a second. <clears throat> okay. Um, so with the with the legislation um, that was shared, uh, one of the things that is important and really appreciated hearing also from the commission uh, regarding apprenticeships and, and pre-apprenticeships, and, and, and I think it is really important that there, just thinking about the conversation that there are so many, I guess, logistics or parameters around apprenticeships and the pre-apprenticeship components. With apprenticeships, obviously, they have a lot of components and a lot of, I guess, restrictions or rules, and we think that's important to understand. And then the pre-apprenticeship idea how that ties to work-based learning and i i think what's important to also mention is um, and i wrote this down in my notes that we really have to work hard um, and i guess this would be important for legislators but also for the department of ed and for the commission um, and for school districts like we can't be in silos and um, i know that i worked specifically with amy fleming with goen and with enchi on some um, some apprenticeship work that we wanted to do with some local businesses uh, and with some um, college work and with ourselves with some students that we wanted this really great partnership and it's just it's very um, it's it's very time intensive and when things are in silos um, that's where things get really held up and so it is really important that we all are speaking the same language and one of the things that i noted as i listened to the commission was some of the language that's used that was used this morning um, doesn't necessarily drive or flow with the way that we're talking about things in k-12 or with even with dual enrollment or the way that k-12 cte at the federal level talks about things so um, i'm just going to encourage us all as we move forward because this is this is where the meat and potatoes of moving forward with where learning needs to go, um, that we have to act, we absolutely um, need to not work in silos and we need to have all the right people at the table. Um, and as we think about legislation um, and barriers, maybe that sometimes that causes, we need to, we need, just need to think about that um, as we work forward. But for legislation uh, with AB 38 specifically, when we were talking about work-based learning programs, um, Craig was able to talk about how uh, things change for work-based learning, and it really did remove that the, the CTE requirement for work-based learning being removed out of there. Um, it does still require, though, that all of our work-based learning programs um, have to be approved by the State Board of Education. And those applications actually are very time intensive and pretty complex. Um, and so, um, and, and, and rightfully so. It has to be very well thought out, very much like what we heard Commissioner um, 
the commissioner talk about with apprenticeships, right? There, there are very specific things that have to be involved. We want to make sure that those employers are vetted and that there's a very clear plan about how those students that are going to go to work-based learning, um, how we evaluate uh, what's happening on those programs and that how we evaluate those employers. And so um, that legislation uh, does have a lot entailed. We also several years ago had some grant funds that were being used for schools to build the work-based learning programs and those applications. That money doesn't exist anymore. So some school districts have used the funds from ESSER uh, for a couple of years anyway, until it runs out uh, to hire staff to help with work-based learning. But beyond that, there, there are no funds available for these uh, really important necessary programs. So that's the part that I'm gonna tell you, if if we're going to put our, um, our money where our mouth is and say that these are the most important things moving forward for our workforce, uh, for our state, then we're gonna have to find a way to fund it uh, because it's, it's, it's exhausting. And Superintendent Teal and myself, you know, I'm in a, a 3,300 student district, Pam's district is smaller, but she and I both, I'm the one running work-based learning right now, uh, along with the other gazillion things I'm trying to, to do to help support our school district. Um, and Pam would be doing the same thing for hers. Um, and I just cannot get it all done. I cannot get it all done. Um, and so the state board requirement of what it takes to get a program through, through that legislation um, is something to think about. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Pam to talk about some of the things that are happening in our state. Um, and then uh, Dr. Barton can talk also about what's happening um, in Clark County. Thank you, Summer. Pam Teal, Lincoln County School District for the record. Um, so there are various workplace uh, work-based learning programs across the state with the legislation that was created. But as, as Summer and um, Shannon spoke to, the funding is an issue. And so we're working hard to provide those opportunities because we know how valuable those opportunities are. I'm um, getting them approved through the State Board of Ed. I think uh, both of us have already spoke to that. Um, districts are getting started on those and are building programs and opportunities. And NDE is, um, we have regular meetings to encourage and work on that. Um, but there are some barriers there. And there are more work-based learning programs versus apprenticeships um, at, or pre-apprenticeships. And I think now um, from the previous um, presentations, we kind of know why, but how valuable those are. Um, my local context, we, uh, Lincoln County School District has been working for several years now on creating and building out the portrait of a graduate within pathways by ninth grade that, in, that increase the opportunities for the future of our students. And so we've, we've done some work around CTE um, and vision work, and I'm, I'm completing some of that right now. And just as uh, uh, Summer Stevens spoke to with the silos, it became very clear to me um, yesterday that CTE still is looked at as a separate thing. It, it is not included even, the high schools don't even sometimes include those folk in professional development and other things that I'm like, well, I thought you guys knew all of that and they're not included in all of that. And so those silos have to be broken down. I think we're good for the next slide, Summer. There we go. Um, examples of what are occurring. Um, as as uh, Churchill work-based learning, they are trying to build that uh, Fallon forward. Elko County is developing some programs to extend health science opportunities. They're developing partnerships with construction tech. Um, Lyon County has, has really worked hard to develop um, opportunities with 41 different businesses and vetting those and getting those partnerships and internships uh, work experience together. Um, you can see their dental assistant certifications, some, uh, lots, lots of hard work to get those students what they need in their workplace experience. Um, and then one other thing, because I'm gonna need to jump off to before the CTE discussion today. The other thing that the barriers of licensure. So as uh, Shannon spoke this morning about those that are retiring and then people coming in to fill those jobs. Even if I have an entry level teacher who wants to come into a CTE position, um, the licensing barriers to be able to do what they need to do is significant to where they have to get another uh, 
endorsement on their uh, uh, license to then be qualified. So let's say they are able to do welding and welding tech. But if they want to do the auto part, because Lincoln can't hire four teachers, I can only hire one. If they're able to do the auto part, they would have to go back and do a whole nother program, 36 hours worth of coursework to have that added on their license. And so as I have my veteran um, here, I, I'm in Alamo, Nevada today at Paranagat Valley. And when my 33 year teacher finally does retire, I'm gonna struggle to replace him with somebody that has licensure that's even able to do what he was doing. Um, so now we have some Clark County examples. Oh, and Pam, before you continue and we turn it over to Clark, um, I, I would like to just share a couple additional examples, um, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so with with our building fell in forward, uh, the work that, that that we're trying to do is again, we tried to target small um, to, to, to try to get things started up because the struggle is real. Um, we, we started before the pandemic with a work uh, work um, workplace readiness and, and uh, work-based learning advisory group and really start targeting, like, what does that look like up through the ranks? Because when we think about our, our school counseling department, the idea about career development is one of their three standards. But even in Churchill County, for a long time, I only had two school counselors for a thousand kids at the high school. I had one school counselor for 750 kids at the middle school. One of my elementaries didn't even have a school counselor. So I was working to even build the counseling department to even start tackling career advisement. And, um, and so we started tackling, like, what does that look like through the K-12 ranks of, of developing their career, their future stories, right? And, and how do you even explore careers? And how do you get into job shadowing? And how do you get into, you know, panels? Um, and, and how does that look? And how, you know, how can the state build that up? Um, and again, so this and the CTE conversation really do go hand in hand, even though they're separate, separate topics. Um, but, but we started working on that and started to spell that out K-12, as I think many districts have tried to do. Um, but that's an area that we don't do very well in when we do our CTE um, assessment of, of our programs is that career development, career design work. Um, but we've been working with uh, an organization in our community to try to start getting the, um, the, the local folks, the industry folks, um, to partner with us so that we can actually have students um, that earn credit for high school, um, because right now, they, earn, they can earn credit for a, a course called Career Vocational Education, or there's also um, work-based learning credit that goes with a particular career pathway. So that gets coded differently in the system for our Perkins grant. And so um, we, are, we are trying to target our kids in work-based learning for Perkins grant through the CTE pathways because that was manageable for me as a superintendent to try to, to balance along with what we're doing. Uh, we don't have very many students in it. We've been trying to manage it through a system, uh, but students get credit. They also are in paid, paid um, situations. It's not unpaid internships. So I think, um, and then you've seen uh, again from what some of the other school districts are in, but we're trying to target every area possible because we have a lot of program um, areas, but we're also trying to target that they also are in dual enrollment. So we're trying to make it multifaceted, just like what you are hearing this morning um, with the apprenticeship side, so that we are preparing students to be able to be employ employed literally when they're leaving high school with credits, um, you know, with certifications and so on. Um, and again, the, the latter part of with the CTE, you're going to see that kids are leaving high school with credits, with licensures, with certifications, um, and that's really the, the same conversations. So I think it's really important, uh, though, that that we share. We need more help. We don't need any more legislation, for sure. Which we need more money, and we need more bodies because we cannot do it. Like, we need boots on the ground to be able to be in seats to and to be out like pound in the pavement to get the employers on board, to vet the employers, to be at the high schools, like recruiting the kids, like to be, you know, doing that work. Cause I, I can't do it. I mean, that's my plea to you is like, how do we do it? Um, and the people who are passionate about kids, future stories, 
because I am super passionate about school becoming this kind of work and getting and getting kids like um, out there doing great work uh, for employers and and that becoming the future of education. But we just don't have the people right now like this. that's killing us. <laughs> so I just you know, I it, it's my passion like the CTE like flipping school to be about this is why kids come to school. You know, as an English teacher, they they didn't come to learn about Chaucer. Sorry, like I mean, I wish they did, but they didn't. They came to they, they came to do this stuff they love to do, and so if we can make school about this, but I need the bodies, and the and and the ability to fund this to get kids out in the in the workforce, um, and practicing and doing it. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to to Mike because again, in Clark County, um, you guys have different opportunities uh with with just your you know your locale probably to do some other things um to get kids into the workforce thank you superintendent stevens uh mike barton for the record clark county school district uh dr jara had every intent to be at this presentation today he's passionate about this subject but he's uh representing the district for magnet schools of america locally and accepting uh several national recognitions from that organization my first comment is that I'm very empathetic toward uh, my rural colleagues where uh, we, we have a work-based learning coordinator uh, that initially was uh, provided through dollars from the legislature. When those dollars did go away, as Dr. Stevens mentioned, uh, we did sustain that position with general fund dollars to keep those connections going with local employers, those partnerships and bringing them in to see the, the classrooms that we have to support the work, uh, we've kept that going and to create that synergy. Uh, it does it's a challenge in a small rural community to keep that or even have that position identified. So again, my my empathy is great for that for that area. Uh, we have you know teaching and training programs, uh, diesel technology, uh, industrial maintenance, uh, and what we've tried to do. And and again, we're going to get to the CTE part here in a minute. We've tried to continuously break down that stigma where our counselors and Dr. Stevens talked about this greatly is that we want our counselors to really be that conduit with work-based learning uh, opportunities. And we've, we've provided national clearinghouse data to our counselors showing that 50% of our kids are going to college, 50% are not. So what's the pathway for them? So when you have high case ratios for counselors where they're supposed to focus on these things, we wanna focus on pathways for the 50% not going to college. Uh, sometimes they're stretched thin with their caseloads. They're focused on SEL. They're focused on crisis, frankly. Uh, coming out of a pandemic. So the counselor is a, a key role with building those connections for work-based learning. In connection to apprentice, apprenticeships, we've, uh, we've taken our counselors on field trips to our local uh, unions, whether it's our crane operators, uh, elevator operators, carpenters. Counselors have been the front lines to go on these uh, field trips to see how they can promote those apprenticeship opportunities for our current seniors as they start to get ready for graduation from the K-12 system. So those are just a couple of examples from Clark County and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Stevens. Awesome, thank you. So at this time we would, we would stand for um, any questions but we appreciate your time uh, because again, we all, I think we all love, love this and we love this is the direction and we wanna do whatever we can uh, to, to ensure that um, we're part of whatever we can uh, do to, to make this happen in Nevada. Great, thank you very much. So, um, so we, we can ask questions uh, we, from the department as well as from the, the district representatives. So, um, who, um, questions, who has questions? Yeah, Simone Thomas. Thank you, uh, Chair Dennis. My question actually, when I'm, I'm hearing <clears throat> excuse me, um, continuously that um, there's a training deficit in our um, um, apprentice program for our schools. And I just was wondering, have um, there been a reach out to our colleges and universities? Have we gone to our retirement community, meaning and our unions? We have a lot of union workers that are actually retired that could go into school and teach and or train. And um, I was wondering, 
Are we reaching out to all aspects in order to get our kids trained the way uh, we would like them to be trained? Hey, whoever wants to answer, that's fine. Uh, uh, Superintendent Stevens, uh, for the record, uh, we certainly, uh, and I know that Superintendent Teal spoke to this in terms of the concern in terms of getting getting folks um, in for licensure to to be able to do this. I, I will speak for Churchill County. Um, we certainly um, we actually reach out to anyone possible uh, when we have openings, and we and we reach out to anyone possible to actually bring people in when we have uh, a need for additional skill development for students um, in K-12. And I know our local um, college, Western Nevada College, does the same thing when they're building their, um, when they're looking for professors or trainers to provide, um, to provide training on any, any particular skill, welding, construction, and so on. Um, now, again, the licensure piece, if you're looking for someone long-term, um, you know, obviously that's different than if you're just looking for someone to provide a, an intermittent training on, on a particular skill. Um, and to be honest, we're not always finding that people want to come out to do it for the long term. Uh, the, the pay is not there always for what someone's looking to do. Well, thank you. But um, I do know as a retiree that, um, you know, a lot of retirees are looking for um, additional work. Um, it keeps them going. And um, especially in our trades, these are, this is an untapped, you know, we're just letting it um, go. And uh, that's, you know, uh, we can keep them employed if that's what they would like to do. Um, and, um, you know, any resource to me is a good resource. And why uh, aren't we using, you know, our colleges and universities, these uh, students that are, you know, grad students, you know, this would be uh, good for them? I think we are. I don't, I don't think we're not. I guess that's my question. I, to answer your question, I don't think we're not using them. At least our district does use whoever we can. We partner with the college. We have a lot of dual enrollment opportunities. We do put out for anybody who's in a program um, to participate with us. Um, when we have an opening in CTE, we open it to anyone. We, we, we're looking for anyone who can uh, work and be licensed and we help people get licensed with a business and industry license. I, Which would I be thank someone you. who and is not a trained teacher. <laughs> And I thank you, and I'm hopefully that you're reaching out to the trades um, because they do have a, a group of people that are retiring on a yearly basis, monthly basis, and um, this would be a great resource. Thank you. Pam Teal, for the record, I just was going to follow up on that one from, from another district perspective. I think we're going to be at an all-time high this coming school year of teachers that will retire and that will come back in a critical need position and still fill uh, educational content. I know that I will, I have three critical need positions right now. Um, two of them are bus drivers because um, I can't find them. And so we've brought them back retired critical need. I probably will have a science come back um, and willing to come back to do a critical need position. So I think our communities are tapping those, um, those those that are willing to come back and teach after they've taught for more than 30 years. So that is occurring. Great, thank you. Uh, other questions? Do we, um, I don't see, um, how about uh, some of them enhance it? Any questions? Yes, I have one, please, yes. Chair. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Thank you for the presentation, and um, Dr. Uh, Summers Stevens, I wanted to follow up on some of the things that you mentioned, if I noted them correctly, about what the stumbling blocks are, and of course financing, and I think uh, Ms. Chambers mentioned that apprenticeship programs are not funded at the state level, and then you have elicited some other, th some other things, so financing, state paperwork, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 
And then also a need for counselors. Did I get some of those stumbling blocks correct? Yes. And and if I could follow up, Chair, I I would like to really my I'm ask. Just, um, so, sure. Uh, hold on one second. So I, I thought I heard a yes, but whoever said that, just identify yourself so that way the record shows who said it. Sorry, thank you. This is Superintendent Summer Stevens for the record. Yes, those those were uh, several of the things that I shared. Uh, one additional I think would be that sometimes we're in silos, all of these different entities that we're not necessarily all working together on it. We're working on these items. All We're all working on the items, but we're still working on them separately. So we end up spending a lot of energies separately instead of together. Thank Great. you. Okay, sorry about interrupting you there. Go ahead. Thank you. And yes, I actually had noted that on a, on a previous slide, I think. So thank you for tying that together for me. When we, um, I, I think what, what I find interesting and the thing I find most helpful about these presentations is when we as legislators are able to hear from those in the field what the barriers are. And unfortunately, I think we do create those barriers sometimes, maybe by unintended consequences with legislation. And so believe me, I heard you, and I'm an advocate about what you said, that you don't need any more legislation. So what I would like to ask is, perhaps offline, if you could give us, or those also involved in all of this, all the other presenters, give us a list of how you would see us navigate this. Is there something legislatively, legislatively we need to do or not do? I, I just attended a public lands meeting in Ely on Friday, and all the presenters were doing this very thing, and it was so enlightening to hear what the need is from your perspective in the trenches, and then to hear what you don't need us to do so that we further impede or maybe put a barrier in place. So if you don't mind some homework, I would love for all of us to receive um, maybe an email or a report that would say, this is the map that we, that we see um, and these are the things that we can help you with. And that's kind of Thank you. the Thank extent you, of what I have to Hansen. say. <laughs> uh, Superintendent Stevens, for the record. Thank you, Assemblywoman Hanson. Um, you know, certainly uh, we, we, we always welcome any opportunity. I would say that superintendents, we, we love the opportunity to share with all of you um, what I guess what, what we'd like to see be different. Um, and we certainly can, can work on that. Um, we, we are super, super busy and, uh, but we will, we will, I will take that back to our, our crew uh, because it is, you know, this is, this is the challenge always. And again, all of you are tasked with similar to schools, right? Like it isn't just one thing we do at schools. We're, we're tasked with health and wellness and, and reading and social emotional learning and money and, and everything, food, and, and you're tasked with all those same things. And, um, and tying it together is what's really most important because that's the only way we're ever going to get it done, right? Is we have to, we have to tie all of the ends together um, and, and connect all of the dots. And so I appreciate that. And I think, um, and, and, and in conjunction with, with the Nevada Department of Education um, and Craig, I think that would make a lot of sense how we could tie this presentation, also the next one with CTE, how we could look at really all the parts, right? All of that legislation and with what's at the state board and what's required of us around um, work-based learning and CTE and this future of learning and the needs economically, like, and with going, like, how do we tie this all together and what our needs are and present that back to you? Thank you for that. And I know you have, a, all of you have so much on your, on your plate already. I don't want to give you another assignment, but maybe with kind of an open-ended deadline that we just maybe receive some feedback before the next legislative session. Um, or before bill drafts are finalized um, so that we make sure that we're not treading where it's going to further impede or we could offer some solutions. So thank you so much for all that you all do out there in the field. Thank you. Uh, some of them, uh, Hanson, I just wanted to bring um, point out that um, what 
a lot of what we're as a committee what we're doing is getting all these presentations and our staff is also taking notes as we go through and when we get to our last couple of meetings is when we're going to actually be talking about what kind of legislation um, you know like like they talked about some of these barriers and things what kind of things we can do and, and we, we're going to follow up with people that have presented um, also to give them an opportunity to give some suggestions um, so so yeah, so we're, we we think that that's very important, and uh, that's how that we've um, in the past we've been able to get some really good um, things to be able to work on during session um, because they come from these presentations that we're getting. So so we are working on that, and our staff also helps us with that. Okay, um, any other questions? I'm not hearing any. Um, all right, so we are now going to go then to the next presentation, which is item number um, six, presentation concerning the expansion and challenges of magnet and career and technical education programs in Nevada. Thank you, Chair Dennis. This is Jessica Todman for the record. The Nevada Department of Education is pleased to provide an update on career and technical education today. I want to emphasize that while Nevada is home to many outstanding career and technical academies, career and technical education is delivered in comprehensive high schools as well as in these specialized academies. Further, while magnet programs provide career and technical education, they're overseen at the local level and not by the Department of Education. So we are pleased that you have invited our district colleagues to speak to their work with magnet programs. And again, I will now hand it over to Director Craig Stachuki to provide an overview of CTE in the state. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Dennis, members of the Legislative Committee on Education. For the record, I am Craig Stachuki, the Director of the Office of Career Readiness, Adult Learning, and Education Options for the Nevada Department of Education. I am Happy to provide you with an update on career and technical education this morning. The enrollment in CTE programs of study have steadily been increasing and enrollment in CTE, secondary CTE courses is up 5.1% from the 2020-21 school year and a 10.2.8% increase from 2019-2020. Our office is committed to ensuring that CTE programs of study are aligned with Nevada's economic needs by ensuring alignment between secondary, post-secondary, and workforce. Our CTE programs across the state are funded through federal Perkins, Perkins 5 funding and also through the state CTE grant funds. The department has at least one secondary CTE program of study in each of the national, 16 national career clusters. Our CTE programs of study are developed in, in coordination with the Governor's Office of Economic Development and Demand Occupation List. And as that list changes, we always, as that, I guess, list changes, updates, we're always looking to see and make sure that we're, we're providing the CTE pathways that are aligned with the in-demand occupations in Nevada. However, initiating and implementing new programs of study in emerging fields is difficult because we are competing against the same workforce that businesses in those emerging fields are, are, are trying to hire workers in. This slide provides an overview of disaggregated CT enrollment compared to the representation of each student group in overall student population. So for example, 51% of Nevada's secondary students are male and 53.2% of CTE participants are male. Generally speaking, the percentage of students participating from each student population group has not changed significantly over the last three years. The department utilizes a variety of resources, including the GOED in demand occupation list, as well as Nevada workforce development reports, such as reports from West End and the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance, to ensure that CTE programs are aligned, directly aligned, or develops transferable skill sets with high skill, high wage, in demand occupations within the state of Nevada. The federal the Federal Perkins 5 legislation passed in 2018 allows states to utilize federal CTE funds to provide CTE programming for students in middle school. The department has recently added middle school courses to its CTE course catalog for school districts to provide CTE to middle school students. As you look at these demographics, I would like to point out that while the middle school enrollment um, is um, Essentially, the middle school enrollment is all middle school students, but when you're looking at the CTE programs, we, are, we're, we have a limited number of CTE middle school programs, primarily in Clark, Washoe, and the charter schools. And so it's not, the CTE data is not necessarily reflecting the statewide data that's in the student population. The school districts and charter schools who have implemented a recognized middle school CTE program are utilizing funds from Perkins and state CTE funds. However, the department does not have a dedicated middle school CTE funding stream. 
The department has initially developed standards in these six program areas for middle school students, which will provide students the opportunity to explore various career pathways and identify CTE programs of study that they would like to pursue upon entering high school. As students have the opportunity to participate in CTE programs in middle school, we hope that they will transition in, in, uh, this will transition into increased enrollment in CTE programs at the high school level and increased academic success. 16 school districts, including the State Public Charter School Authority, have CTE programs to study. And this is a breakdown in terms of their population uh, by district, and, uh, par participation in their CTE programs by district. A significant portion of the growth in CTE programs of study has come from the development of new programs of study, including military science, cybersecurity, and multimedia communication. It is important that as we establish high quality CTE programs of study in the career pathways that lead to occupations in priority areas for the state of Nevada. Enrollment in the, in the number of programs has increased in each of these since 2018-2019. The foundational courses in health science and engineering are entry-level courses for a wide variety of CTE programs in those fields. If we look specifically at the information technology career cluster, we are seeing a significant increase, significant increases in computer science and cybersecurity as more schools and school districts add these programs of study. And I will say this is my favorite slide in every presentation. Students who complete two years of a CTE program of study are considered a concentrator. As you can see from this chart, students in, students in, a, in, students in any student population group who complete two years of, program, of the same program of study have a higher graduation rate than their peers who do not participate in career technical education. As we look to improve student access to career and technical education across the state, we are currently in the process of revising our course sequences and standards to become two-year sequences, which will allow school districts and schools the flexibility to do what's best for their students and their community in years three and, three and four, and provide students with more opportunities to engage in CTE programs during their high school career. We believe that the revised course sequences will increase opportunities for students to earn dual credit and for schools to provide concurrent enrollment courses within their, their normal day. In addition, we believe this also offers opportunities for students to increase their participation in work-based learning as previously discussed. One of our best models for dual enrollment is the Jumpstart Teaching and Training 3 and Teaching and Training Advanced Studies courses in the Clark County School District and their partnership with Nevada State College. Not only are we seeing a large number of students earning dual credit, but the partnership between Clark County School District and Nevada State College includes professional development for secondary educators to ensure that high school teachers are providing the rigor that meets the expectations of success for a post-secondary student, and they are both currently working on a model for internships that will be piloted in the fall at two, at two schools. We believe that the transition to two-year CTE program sequences will open doors for districts and public charter schools to partner with their post-secondary institutions and provide additional opportunities for students to participate in concurrent enrollment and dual credit opportunities and putting students on a pathway to, to earning post-secondary credentials. Oops, click too quick. Thank you for your time. I know the superintendents have a presentation as well, but I'm, I'm available for any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Yeah, let, let's go ahead and go to the district presentation. Thank you. Sorry, my everything's on delay here on my end. <laughs> Hold on, I'll share my screen. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Summer Stevens, for the record, uh, Superintendent Teal had to head out, but I'm also still joined uh, with Dr. Mike Barton from uh, Clark County. So we'll um, move on to uh, our elements related to current technical education and talk a little bit about, again, most recent legislation. I think it's important to hear about that and some impacts that that occurred but um this is also this is this is a passion area of of mine so i was excited to be able to speak about it and uh, mike's going to be able to also share about uh the magnet situation because right now uh, with one exception with white pine school district clark county is the only school district with magnets 
uh, schools. So a, um, in AB 38, which we talked about with the work-based learning, that particular legislation, I really appreciated previous uh, staffing in the Cralio office at the Nevada Department of Education uh, was able to work with school districts, which we were very grateful for, to make some changes to that particular legislation and some of the roadblocks that were um, in place prior to the 2021 session. One of those being that the technical skills committee that was required as part of that legislation uh, had an open meeting law requirement and it made it very difficult to always be able to function because as you all know with open meeting uh, law, not that it's not important to involve the public, but sometimes it actually impedes you from getting work done because you have to cancel if you don't have all of the right people at the table or you don't have everyone able to be there. Um, and so uh, oftentimes things, especially in small districts, if you don't have the, the quorum, you can't function. And so that was one of the elements that, that was taken out. Um, and then the flexibility for either a, a technical skills committee to be able to meet or for the superintendent uh, to have an alternative to establishing uh, the technical skills advisory and being able to meet with separate um, stakeholder groups that covers the, the different stakeholders that are required. Uh, so including students, most importantly, the students in career and technical education, the industry partners, um, the higher ed, the post-secondary folks, the governor's workforce development folks, uh, special populations, that's super important. Um, our agencies that are serving students, our homeless youth um, and our at-risk populations, our Native American students, um, our parents, uh, and our in-school staff, our, our uh, school staff representatives as well. So um, that has created great flexibility. So I wanted to share that the changes that happened in the last session as related to CTE, um, in this regard, we're extremely happy about. So thank you um, to the legislature for those changes. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to talk a little bit about um, CTE then in our schools. So um, as um, Director Statuki talked about, districts are able to offer a wide range of CTE programs across the state at the, at the high school level, but also now that we're getting into the, sec the, the middle school level as well. Part of what is required now with the Carl Perkins federal level uh, use of funds is what is called the Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment. We are in our second phase, our second iteration of that process that we focus on high wage, high demand um, occupations, either at the regional need level, the state um, national need level. This process is done every two years. Um, and we also now use it for our state um, funding as well for those applications. And so that process is pretty comprehensive. Uh, it does take quite a bit of time. Uh, we had two years ago, we completed our very first cycle of this. Um, and now we just finished our second uh, cycle and the, we work with the Department of Education to, to submit that, but we include stakeholders. We ask a lot of questions of students, of staff, of parents, um, and of our business and industry partners. We look at the data. Uh, about the needs of our community, of the region. Uh, we work with the, with the governor's office of, of innovation and workforce, uh, with colleges and, um, and universities on what the needs are. So um, that I think is really important, but it is, again, it is a lot of work, but it is necessary because I think this is a transition. Uh, many of you, hopefully you participated in, um, in courses in high school. And a lot of times we participated in them because they were fun. They, they might not have been necessarily what we were gonna go into, uh, uh, but that's where the change is happening uh, in our country is, and, and the change in high school. And I think that's something to note is, I think in, when I was in high school, kids did take different variety of classes. It might've been something you were going to potentially go into is a field of, uh, of for your uh, career, but a lot of people took things because they were fun and interesting. Um, I know I personally didn't take the classes that I took in high school um, in in the fields of career and technical education. I actually like to call them career pathway courses, but I didn't necessarily take them in high school because I was going to do them. I did take um, like a, a, a lighting and electrical course. I did take automotive 
because I want, and I built engines with my dad because that was something we had in common and we like to do that. Um, and so, but I didn't intend to necessarily do that. I took family consumer science because I just loved cooking. Um, I actually did pursue that as a pathway at one point to do culinary arts um, and uh, food service management. But today, the focus for CTE is really to get kids into pathways that they may do as a career. And I think sometimes that's one of the things we have to think about is that that is what we're training kids up on. And so sometimes the standards are very difficult. Um, they're not just for fun anymore. They really are high, high um, standards that we're getting kids into. And so I think it's important to remember that as we go through this. Um, the, the work that Craig talked about with middle schools, um, here in Churchill County, we do some exploration where we actually introduce kids um, and we haven't been able to get that to take off as much as we'd like, but it's more exploration, even though they have standards down to those six areas that he showed you. Um, ours is more, we show the eighth graders, we take them through a course where they get to see all of the programs we have at the high school level. So we're, that's kind of where we're at um, at this point. Uh, the state NDE has act, the access grant, and that is actually, it's two parts. One is to increase the opportunities to rural districts for CTE options that can be done virtually as, uh, for the rural districts, because as you will see in a few minutes, and you might've seen in your packet, some of the rural districts have a robust set of opportunities. Some do not have as many, um, and that can be due to the staffing that they have available. The access grant is working toward providing the CTE course options virtually to kids um, in the rural districts that, that kids could have access to more pathways than they would have in person. Um, that grant also is trying to create access to advanced placement courses um, as well. Changes in the technical skills advisory requirement that I brought up from legislation has been beneficial and we are loving it. So thank you again, legislators, uh, for that change in the legislation. The, um, excuse me, the challenges uh, that Pam uh, Teal had talked about, that licensure piece. So we have that great opportunity with the business and industry licensure. Um, we just continue to um, ask that we, we always have that flexibility to get people in. I am in Churchill County. I am on my third um, automotive technology, diesel technology staff member. Um, I've been in the district, this is my fourth year and I am on my third teacher. And it is the fourth teacher we've had in the last five years um, because for many, again, the salary with a business and industry licensure, you get a certain amount of time before you have to get a bachelor's degree um, in, or um, the, take the certain classes uh, to in teaching, if you will, to be able to, in our district, to be in the salary table. And so if you're in automotive, for example, and you have been, say, taking your training at UTI, um, you might not want to come into teaching you, you might have some benefits like in health insurance and that sort of thing in the Nevada retirement, but you could be making double the salary staying in automotive, um, working at, at a, a dealership, for example. So these are some of the things that, that just come into to play. The other side of the coin is if you're not trained in the pedagogy of teaching and learning, um, that's, a, that's a different shift for things, especially when you're gonna be working with 13 and 14 year olds, um, if that's not something you're used to, especially if you're coming into it with a business and industry licensure, and you may only be 22 years old and you went and got trained at, a, at an automotive school um, and you think now I wanna come back and, and give back, but you also don't necessarily like working with 20, uh, 14 year olds isn't, maybe that's not something you have any experience with. Right? So these are the things that, that are considerations, the availability of staffing. So I did appreciate in the previous um, conversation about the staffing and the use of other, other folks, the, the retired folks um, in business and industry and coming back in and how do we tap more of the people uh, to get them into the, into the schools um, and supporting kids. You know, I think that we have to think through how we do volunteering, you know, the, the time of COVID, we really shut down how many people could be in schools volunteering, but now I think we have to rethink how do we ramp that back up and get those supports into classrooms. 
Um, and then we have the funding of programs, staffing, equipment, consumables, the, the career and technical student organizations. Um, we're super grateful that our state has the state um, CTE funding, the Perkins, the federal funding. Um, these programs, the career and technical education programs are the most expensive programs when you talk about school, that and then sciences, right? English is not an expensive program to run um, outside of the staffing. Math is not expensive outside of the staffing. Um, these programs all require consumable products. These programs all require state-of-the-art industry standard equipment. The, you know, these all require consumables. So we have to think about how we, um, if we want kids to have these hands-on experiences, how that looks um, and sounds. So I, I think that's something to, to consider. So awareness and engagement, that was one of the questions that you all proposed to us. Um, how do kids know about these programs, right? Awareness and engagement occur in a number of ways, and it's including but not limited to addressing the career development that we talked about in the previous presentation by school counselors, by the teachers in these programs, really by the teachers in any, any area, by the elementary teachers. Um, you know, that we're talking about um, in social studies, we talk about what is, who works in your community. That's one of our standards, right? Like what, who makes up our communities and what do people do in the community? Um, you know, that's really important where all that starts that we talk about, you know, how is science used in jobs? How is English and reading used in jobs? Like we have to start talking about it early. Um, and then we have to start making kids curious and helping them be curious about what's out there. Um, so it does, it really takes everyone. And, you know, if we're not engaging kids, um, and that's what I talked about, like, um, I'm a huge proponent of like flipping school and um, teaching about math and English in, in other areas, because that is why kids come to school. So we need our math and English and science and, and social science teachers to, to help connect kids to like, why do we learn about those things? We learn about it because we're all going into careers someday, right? Like we're all in a career and we all are gonna use different skills and, and, um, and competencies we learn in a job out there in the world. And so uh, we need to help kids connect that. Um, but also we are working hard with our various subpopulations to ensure equity and access and make sure that all students and all parents know about all of these opportunities. Um, and we do that through talking with our transition um, coordinators that are working uh, when our students are working with IEPs at the different levels going from elementary to middle and middle to high and high school out into the work workforce, that we're publicizing that as districts to our parents about um, that, that these different things are occurring. occurring. Um, I think we have to work hard with our parent organizations when they have the, the state parent organization, uh, PTO type of um, opportunities that parents know that different programs exist. Um, these are different ways that, that we're also working with all of those groups with that comprehensive local needs assessment and that we're asking people for their thoughts, for their needs. Um, and what they know about different uh, different opportunities at the schools. And that then we're getting kids um, into pathways. Uh, Director Satuki talked about that those programs are going from the three year to the two year. This really gives uh, kids an opportunity to, to try different things out and not be, I guess, stuck into one thing um, and then not get a chance to try out different things or to try something and find it's not their bailiwick and then um, that they can try something else. So kids are going to be able to actually try out different things or mix and match things that can help them on a career trajectory um, where they can combine a, a couple of different things that will help them out. Um, and I think one of the, the things that I would note is we don't know even in three years what the jobs are, let alone five years, let alone 10 years, right? And so it's super important um, for us all to think about all kids need to be thinking about skills and um, those, those transferable skills and what they can, those work readiness skills, and all kids need those. And all kids can learn those from CTE courses. And so thinking about um, kids that think they're going to go to college 
we don't just go to college to go to college. We go there because we're going to have a career someday. And so thinking about what CTE courses could help with the college slash career that I'm going to go into, if I'm going to be an engineer, I should probably take some CTE courses that are hands-on applications of the engineering area that I want to go into, possibly. So I can try it out, see how I feel about it. Um, for example, my own child is thinking about going into engineering. Um, she is taking right now um, the automation uh, course at WNC, um, the automation um, uh, course that is, um, it's actually uh, like a traveling course in a trailer where the, the actual labs are, are occurring. Um, and so it's been really interesting and she's being able to actually apply some things um, uh, through, through that process that she's really good at math and science, but she's not done a lot of hands-on things. So um, that's been really exciting. Um, she also got to take um, the health science pathway and the CNA program through CTE and learned that she really didn't want to do health science. So that's a great thing to learn um, in high school. So following that, then I think a great thing to understand is that um, I call it a triad that for kids in high school, the um, experiencing the triad that ties back to our first presentation too is the triad of learning for kids that helps them really start to develop this understanding of what their future story can be is this work of the courses that high school provides in career pathways, along with work-based learning in areas uh, that they've studied, along with this, the, the CTSOs, which is the Career and Technical Student Organizations, FFA, FC, um, FCCLA, um, FBLA, DECA, Skills USA, um, and, and HOSA, those are those in our state, but those organizations where they actually get to then um, learn and compete in the skills areas that they have studied um, and maybe actually out been working in um, and compete at the state and even national or international levels. That's a great triad to build your skills um, and, and, and learn forward. Our state also has um, access to something called NEPRIS, which is um, uh, online, so um, synchronous and asynchronous, so live and, and recorded opportunities with business and industry partners that um, teachers can use to um, provide exploration to students for business and industry partners, uh, presenters to be panelists. To, um, I use it. Um, I actually teach the teaching and training class first year program at our high school right now. Um, so we actually use it to explore and um, provide opportunities for our kids to learn from teachers uh, about what does it mean to be a teacher. But you can actually, as a teacher, set up, for example, your math classroom. You could have a live discussion with people um, out in the world, engineers, scientists, uh, people that, that work for different business and industry, how they use math in their everyday lives and kids can have interactions with them. So that's an opportunity that our state has provided to school districts, all school districts um, and all teachers in school districts can have accounts um, to actually coordinate and have live conversations or recorded conversations with business and industry partners, not only from all over, but you can actually set those up and get people from your local communities to have be part of the NEPRA situation. Uh, the Teaching and Training CTE Rural and Urban Expansion Grant is coming out, um, which is awesome because as we've heard, like teaching, we, we're short teachers. Um, and so we're going to, um, several counties, uh, I believe it's Douglas, Lyon, Churchill, um, Elko, and Clark and Washoe, we're going to be having opportunities to grow our own um, in high school. Um, some of us have started recently with teaching and training. Um, and uh, Director Stutuki talked about that opportunity. Um, in Churchill County, we actually, our level one is dual enrollment with WNC um, and level two will be um, as well. And our kids in level one are actually in um, internships right now. And um, in our year one, we have had um, 11 students started the year. None of them actually signed up on purpose for teaching and training. They just got pushed in there uh, be, to put them in a class. 
and nine continued into second semester. Um, of those nine, six kids do dual enrollment. And next school year, um, there are 40 kids that signed up for teaching and training one. And all of the kids that are in teaching and training one signed up for teaching and training two. So I think that's a pretty big win um, for retention and growing the program. So I shared with you guys, um, should have had that in the packet, and I'm gonna try to click on the link and see if it goes there. Um, the examples across the state of what programs people are offering um, in CTE, and yours looks a little different than this, but this is a link to this. Um, in Churchill, we um, actually offer uh, bet between 18 and next year 20 programs uh, running the gamut from um, agriculture in various ways to culinary arts, uh, three different medical pathways, kids getting licensures in EMT and CNA, um, uh, multimedia communications, video production, drafting and design, uh, things that are phasing out like furniture and cabinetry making, but we do have construction, welding, uh, the automation technology. Uh, we have a lot of these that are dual. They're not listed that way. Then you see in Clark, and we'll let him talk about that in a second, um, lots and lots of programs and specialty schools, which again, um, Washoe has as well. Um, many of the other rules don't have the specialty schools for that. Um, Douglas's offerings, um, you can see Elko's got a lot going on. Um, you know, lots of partnering with the community colleges, which is awesome, because I think in our state, several years ago, we were able to start having this really great conversation with the Nevada Department of Education. Um, not as much since Craig has been on board, but you know, that, that, that COVID situation really kind of put a damper on some of these conversations, but we were doing great great conversing and I look forward to getting back to this idea of these dual enrollments and again how do we get kids on these trajectories to have these licensures and certifications leaving high school and just really being on their way. Um, Lander County uh, some things Humboldt County's Lincoln's uh, with Pam what she was able to talk about Lyons uh, work mineral Nye County Washoe White Pine um, and the charter school authorities what they um, are able to do some people just weren't able to respond so it's not that they don't have opportunities um, and um, I think what was awesome about what Craig showed you and would would reiterate before turning it over to Mike um, is the this notion that our kids who participate in career pathway programming are graduating exponentially higher than anybody else in our state. And as you also saw, our boys and girls really are participating really equally. Now, mind you, maybe not in the non-traditional sense, and that non-traditional sense is our girls in the programs that were traditionally uh, male-dominated fields and vice versa, are, are our males participating in those female-dominated fields? Like we have work to do for sure. Are our at-risk students and our students um, in underrepresented programs participating? Part of that CLN, CLNA work, that comprehensive local needs assessment is really going to challenge all of us as it should to really make sure that we're doing what we are supposed to be doing and ensuring equity and access for everybody to every single program we have and that we're working our tails off to make sure that we are inclusive um, and getting everyone to the table for every program and everything that every kid wants to do that they have access to it. And, and that's my mission in Churchill. And I think that's every, everyone's mission. Um, and, you know, and I, and I, and I want that to be NDE's mission. Um, and I want you to hold us accountable for that. And I, and I want you to help us find the money to make sure that these things are, are accessible to, to every child in Nevada so that we have people in programs out there working um, in our workforce in Nevada. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to, to Dr. Barton now. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Uh, I, I know you saw earlier that in all of our high schools, we have uh, CTE programs, 69 programs to be precise. And then we have obviously a, a footprint regarding our career and technical academies uh, we're expanding three more CTAs in the next three years. Next year, actually August of this year, we'll have our, our new uh, Central Technical Academy that's on Maryland Parkway where the old Gorman used to be. A year after that, we'll have our, our North uh, Las Vegas CTA, which will again have a, a number of programs. One of those being energy technologies. 
Uh, I think the important fact with all of these CTE programs is that some of these curriculums don't even exist yet. So we work with our local employers who have these jobs to help build those curriculums to ensure that at the end of that uh, nine through 12 pipeline that those students are in fact ready to get those jobs, say for instance, in energy technologies. A year after that with the North Las Vegas CTA, we'll have our Henderson site uh, in 2024. So uh, really appreciative of the work of, of Mr. Satuki. I know that he's helped the Clark County School District, particularly on many things. I know licensure has come up as one of those factors uh, that we should be worried about. And I, I think that the NDE has tried to help us, especially with the uh, pedagogy requirements for some of those BNI licenses, um, allowing uh, locally some of our experts to teach the pedagogy courses to those uh, provisionally licensed BNI teachers. So that's uh, that's an opportunity that we've embraced and it's helped with getting those uh, provisions uh, removed from licenses for the BNI uh, licensed individuals. Uh, it, you know, it's not a systemic issue, but there have been cases in Clark County when a, a BNI teacher at the end of their provision time is unable to pass certain requirements. And these are award-winning CTE teachers in certain disciplines. If they're not able to pass a certain test for licensure, they've, they've lost employment. I'm not saying that's systemic, but that definitely hits individual programs where CTE, frankly, is built. It's, it's staff dependent. That if, if, there's staff, if staff can't be hired for a particular program, we have schools locally, and I know the, the rurals obviously struggle with this as well, and if they can't find a teacher for that program, they can't offer construction technology or they can't offer culinary. So that is really dependent on that staffing. As a result of that, uh, we are bringing to our board in short order, actually in the next few weeks, and this is the first time that we've done this, a request for all CTE teachers to be part of critical labor shortage. We've had that part of mathematics, elementary, special education years past, uh, but we're seeing this need and the, that staffing is such an important fact with CTE success that we're asking our board to, to bless that as a, a critical labor area for all CTE programs. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions and appreciate the presentation by Dr. Stevens and, and your support of CTE overall in the state. Thank you. Okay, that's all. Is that the that's all the district ones, right? Oh, go ahead. Um, do you would uh, Summers, Senator Dennis? This is uh, Summer Stevens for the record. Would you like uh, Dr. Barton to present on magnet schools before we take questions? Oh yes, yes. Okay, I'll pull the slide back up then. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Stevens, and thank you, Chair Dennis. Uh, just quickly on magnet schools, I know uh, Dr. Stevens touched on this that. Uh, White Pine County has obviously a STEAM ac Academy uh, for K-5 students at David Norman Elementary School. So outside of, of that, uh, Clark County does make up most of the, the magnet portfolio or options. Uh, we have 41 schools. Uh, the breakdown is in front of you where those uh, programs are in the Clark County School District. And really magnet came to be in the Clark County School District as a result of uh, uh, desegregation work that happened in the early 90s. Uh, that's where we launched uh, our first magnet programs in the historic West Side. And then since then, we've expanded ever since. Uh, we're actually at a stage right now of even applying for another Magnet Schools of America grant, uh, hoping to get a few more in the portfolio. Um, the way that it works for a magnet school is that it's a, uh, a lottery process, an application, uh, the lottery is conducted and monitored by outside counsel to ensure that it's a, a clean process and there are factors built into the lottery where there are sibling preference uh, percentages built into that lottery, uh, geographic preferences to ensure that we're getting to the ultimate goal with magnet schools to create greater diversity in our schools. Um, uh, we've also in recent time uh, changed our criteria for magnet schools uh, in the past for all of our high school programs. It used to be there were behavior and grade requirements, uh, knowing that we need to do better with promoting diversity. So all students have an opportunity to get into one of these 41 schools. Uh, we've removed 
uh, the attendance behavior requirements. Still, however, with our high school programs that are STEM heavy, uh, there are mathematics and science requirements for grades to ensure that we're setting students up for success. But again, we've, we've removed some of the criteria at our, our middle school, was always gone, elementary as well. Uh, this recent work in high school was to again, create uh, better opportunities for all students. Because here's the example that I use. Unfortunately, but before we changed this criteria, you could have had a student in world geography in eighth grade, get a, an N in citizenship with one teacher. And that could have kept them out of a magnet program in ninth grade. So by removing that conduct, maybe that one particular vantage point where maybe there's a personality conflict with one teacher, getting that off the table is allowing opportunity for students to, again, qualify for that lottery for some of our really great magnet programs we have locally. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and address any questions you may have. Okay, Ms. Summers, is that uh, complete? Yep, okay. All right, questions. What questions do we have? Okay, I guess you guys did a great job because I'm not hearing any questions. Um, of course, we know where to find you too, so we can ask questions after. Um, appreciate that. Okay, um, do we have any questions of the department? Because they also presented. I'm not hearing any. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so we're going to go ahead and um, here's what I'd like to do because uh, we've been going for quite a while. I, but I know we're going to lose Ms. Summers on the next item. Um, I think what I'd like is for Ms. Summers to do her part of it um, and then we're going to take a break um, and then we'll finish um, so that we were not because I think it's going to we we'll probably have some questions and it's going to take a while to get through the next item. But I don't. Um, at the, we haven't had a break and we so I think if we can I know that you have to leave um, so we're, we'll take your testimony now and then we'll we'll take a break and then come back and finish so if uh, go ahead. Students, for the record and what I would share is Dr. Barton actually is presenting on the next item um, I can share the legislative part that I was going to share but he actually is presenting uh, fully on the uh, English language component so if you guys would like to take a break, the, the legislative part is not necessarily all that exciting, which you already know the legislation probably. Um, I could present that quickly and then jump off and then you could take your break and come back. Um, I don't know his schedule though. So um, uh, I'm open to entertain he's however you like to proceed. He's, he's a... Okay, and I, my understanding is uh, Dr. Barton um, is is okay and then you can speak up if not um, until one o'clock so I think if we took our break that would give him time to do his presentation before he had he'd have to leave is that correct dr. Barton uh, that's correct chair one o'clock thank you okay so yeah so why don't you do uh, if you could do the okay. your quick part of it okay. there and then we'll take the break okay perfect thank you again uh, dr. Stevens for the record a Churchill County School District but NAS uh, Nevada Association of School Superintendents uh, president. So some impactful legislation related to this next item around English language learners and, 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 and I am not as well versed in this particular area of today's uh, topics, but certainly it's an extremely important uh, area for consideration and um, attention for all of us in, in our state. So in the last legis legis legislative session, AB 195 is, is our topic uh, of legislative uh, consideration for today is around our policy uh, requirement to address issues of teaching students um, who are English language learners. Section six of the bill requires the policy to identify the primary language of our pupils enrolled uh, to assist in identifying our students. It requires that students be placed in our program for English language learners until the pupil obtains uh, the language proficiency based on the appropriate assessment uh, in our state. Section two, here's the, the three sections that we feel uh, it, that NAS feels are super important for us to consider. Section two is uh, a reporting requirement, extensive reporting requirements to the State Board of Education uh, for our students who are enrolled in schools in various categories, including immigrants, refugees, newcomers, English language learner students who have IEPs. Uh, and in that particular category, I think it's extremely important because 
Uh, there's a lot of times that we have an over-identification of students um, with IEPs that are English language learners for a number of um, inappropriate reasons. Um, English language learner students in special programs, including gifted and talented, and maybe an underrepresentation of students in that regard. The data collected on students must be disaggregated by grade um, and pupils who are English language learners. The report must also provide information about teachers, including those that have a teaching um, uh, endorsement, English as a second language endorsement. Uh, Section three requires uh, the outlines the rights of English language learner students, including equal access to an education, regardless of the immigration status. The rights of a parent of an English language learner um, are also outlined in this section, including the right to enroll a student in a public school without disclosing immigration status and receiving information from school district that comes in native language uh, when possible. And that's super important. Um, and I believe school districts are working uh, diligently to ensure that that is happening, uh, especially during the COVID um, times that has been extremely, extremely important. Um, and I know that for our families uh, that uh, need things in a native language, uh, especially related to um, language barriers, in terms of feeling safe and secure of bringing students to school. That has been so important in our county specifically. Um, then section six of that legislation uh, requires to provide a pupil who is an English language student um, to remain in a program for English language learning until that pupil obtains the language proficiency based on the appropriate assessment of pupils who are English language learners, unless the parent or guardian declines to have that student remain in that program. Um, and I think one of the things personally that um, is important that we continue to always uh, strive for is uh, effective communication with our families to ensure that they understand fully uh, what the programs provide um, and that we are effectively communicating um, with our families so that they feel safe and secure uh, about what the program can provide, is providing, um, and that we are for sure providing um, every opportunity to those children um, in our programs and that the parents understand um, and, and that, that we're doing everything we can to communicate with our families and provide the supports um, so, that, um, so that everyone's successful. And uh, I appreciate when we do have legislation that is asking for that. Um, and just like our earlier bills, right? Like that we make sure we take barriers out of legislation, but that we have appropriate legislation so that we're all accountable uh, to providing the, all the success necessary to all of our children and our families in Nevada. So with that, that's just kind of an over, overview of AB 195. Okay, thank you. And, and since we're since we're going to lose you, is there any questions for Dr. Summers on the legislation portion? Okay, I'm not hearing any. Um, okay, so thank you very much. Um, we are going to take a recess now. We're on item number seven, and we're going to take a recess, um, and we're going to go till um, we'll start back up at a quarter after twelve. Um, and I, I I think what I'm what I'll do. Um, is we're we're going to change the order up just a little bit. Um, hopefully this would this works. Um, we'll do the uh, district presentations first, and then we'll do the department and and uh, the uh, Miss Lasso's. Um, so that way we don't we don't if we if if we go longer we don't lose them and we can still do the questions and things like that. So um, so with that we'll 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 be on recess till uh, twelve fifteen.
Okay, we're going to come back from reset, our lunch recess, and we are going to continue with agenda item number seven, presentation on English language learners' plans and challenges. And as I mentioned before, we're going to start with the the uh, the, the NAS represented the, the district representatives um, first, and then um, and then we'll do the. Um, the other two, the department and, and Ms. Lazo. So, um, so I don't know who's going to start that off. Is that you, Dr. Barton? Are you starting it off? Or yes, sir. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, just to, to build off of the points that uh, Dr. Stevens had previously, um, as we look from the NAS perspective regarding English language learners. And I know you have this in front of, I think you have this in the packet that provides an overview on the curriculum and methodology by district. I think there's definite various approaches to working with ELL learners uh, across the districts in Nevada. And there's also difference when you look at that, that spreadsheet, school personnel responsible for the tracking, the development levels of the students. There's also variation as well there. So um, just a couple of highlighted examples briefly would be, um, you know, Churchill, for instance, uh, there's there's pull out instruction and in classroom instruction. Uh, Humboldt County has experienced over the last uh, four years, a, a decline in the number of ELL learners. So they definitely have different contexts when compared to other counties in the state, including Clark. Um, Lander has a full time ELL specialist who trains and manages an entire staff. And then you think about um, Lincoln, uh, again, a smaller number of EL learners, um, a trained teacher who supports uh, what needs to occur in that county. So, um, and then finally, just another example to highlight, an ELAD endorsed EL specialist in Nye County provides the services for ELL learners uh, in that county. Uh, the Clark County School District, you know, I can give a, a brief overview, but I know Ignacio Ruiz is on the call today as well. He's our assistant superintendent for ELL, um, but we have adopted a K-12 language development approach, uh, ensuring ELL learners are afforded opportunities to simultaneously develop content and language within the tier one instruction. Uh, and also uh, our educators are required to uh, attend uh, understanding language development, professional learning. I think a lot of our strategy with ELL is to ensure that our educators are highly trained and highly effective in the classroom. And then we also have a, a, an approach with our newcomer students where we have a, a pathway program developed and we've provided, we're pivoting to a, a robust central provider where we're going to actually have a family support center that monitors all newcomers coming brand new to Clark County and ELL, our department, uh, under the leadership of Ignacio Ruiz, will manage that physical plant to monitor all newcomers coming to the district and providing the appropriate service that they need uh, based on their language skills. Um, so uh, with that, Matt, Mr. Chair, uh, I can turn it back to you for our next presentation. And again, uh, Mr. Ruiz is here if there are any other questions regarding ELL specific to Clark County. Okay, um, do, um, and I think we'll go to the next presentation. Who's doing the next one? Or are, are we ready to go to, um, however, however order you, whatever order you guys wanna do. I just wanna make sure we got all the, the, the uh, district ones in. Chair, we so, have Dr. So Dr. Moore Dr. Martin, up Dr. here. Martin, are you, oh, go ahead. I can't see up north, so I can't see what's going on there. Chair, we have Dr. Moore here to present from NDE. Oh, NDE, okay. So, um, so I just want to make sure, we're, did we get all of the NAS presenters? Okay, then, then we can go with, um, um, then let's go with Dr. Moore. And, um, and then the, what about Clark County? Um, are you presenting? I'm Lorna James Cervantes. I'm actually here on behalf of the English Mastery Council. I actually uh, retired after 30 years this last July from the Clark County School District, so that's why you were thinking I was with them. 
Okay, so that'll so then Dr. Moore is going to start it off, right? Okay, so let's go there. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis, Vice Chair, Chair Bilbury Axelrod, and honorable members of the committee. I'm Dr. Jonathan Moore, and I serve as the Deputy Superintendent for Student Achievement at the Nevada Department of Education. My portfolio includes the Office of Student and School Supports, which provides support for our English learners and also supports the work of the English Mastery Council. I'm joined by my colleague, Carl Wilson, who serves as an Education Program Supervisor, and Lorna James Cervantes, who's the Chair of the English Mastery Council, both of whom will be presenting from Las Vegas. Good afternoon, my name is Carl Wilson for the record. I serve as an education program su supervisor with the Nevada Department of Education. Today I will be providing an update regarding services and progress of English learners in grades K through 12 in Nevada. Lorna James Cervantes, who is the chair of the English Mastery Council, will be co-presenting with me today. And so we'll, oh my, that jumped. <laughs> Thank you. This presentation will focus on four key areas. A brief summary regarding English learner demographics in Nevada's public schools. The transition from the Zoom School English Learner Categorical Funding to the Pupil Centered Funding Plan. Updates on two bills that address supports for English learners that were enacted in 2021, Assembly Bill 195 and in 2019, Assembly Bill 219. And we will conclude with an update from the English Mastery Council regarding its roles, responsibilities, and providing legislative defined recommendations. Statewide data over the last four years has shown a decrease in English learner enrollment from 2018-19 school year level of 73,024 students to 64,334 in the 2020-21 school year. We recognize that this was a drop in enrollment of 8,690 English learners. It is difficult to know the extent to which the impacts of COVID-19 factored into the decrease in EL enrollment, but we have seen now in the 2021-22 school year that the state has begun to rebound in the number of English learners with an increase of 2,358 students back up to just over 66,600 students. As we take a look at Nevada's uh, English learners, we know that there are close to 100 languages that serve as the primary language of English learners and their families. But in Nevada, the top five primary languages other than English are Spanish, Filipino Tagalog, Chinese Zongwen, Vietnamese Amharic. And this will be important as we talk about Assembly Bill 195 in just a few minutes. Historically, in terms of the Zoom EL funding in terms of a categorical program funded by the Nevada State Legislature. Zoom School program was first enacted in 2013. At that time, the focus was on elementary school programs and services for English learners and allocated approximately $25 million per year. Beginning with the 2015 legislative session, the Nevada State Legislature expanded the Zoom School program to additional schools, including the directive to start serving secondary schools and allocated approximately $50 million per year. With the enactment of the Pupil Centered Funding Plan in 2021, the Nevada State Legislature shifted away from the categorical Zoom School program and allocated approximately $85 million based on the weights for English learners that are to be allocated to the schools in which the English learner students are enrolled. When the Zoom School program was initiated in 2013, most of the funding was allocated to Clark and Washoe County School Districts. 
Clark and Washoe County School Districts were to select as Zoom schools low performing schools with the highest concentrations of English learners. The state legislature also provided additional funding for English learner services to districts other than Clark and Washoe and to the state public's charter school authority. The primary purposes of the Zoom school program were to improve English language proficiency for English learners and to improve the academic achievement of English learners. As we take a look at the, th the last three years of the categorical Zoom program, uh, this table represents the number of schools that were served. Clark served 38 schools with an average of 29,500 students over those three years. Washoe served four, or 24 Zoom schools with an average of approximately 11,000 students over that same period. Although not designated as Zoom schools, other school districts besides Clark and Washoe and the State Public Charter School Authority used EL funding over the last three years to serve an average of 53 schools and approximately 5,700 students. In many of those schools, because of the level of funding, those districts and schools chose one or two of the allowable services to meet the needs of English learners. As we take a look at the impacts of COVID-19, we recognize that it created numerous challenges for school districts and charter schools in identifying, serving, and assessing English learners. First, we wanted to highlight in the assessment process that Nevada participates with 41 other states, territories, and federal agencies in the WIDA consortium that supports states in the application of English language development standards and assessments. Both the WIDA English language proficiency screener and annual assessment of English language proficiency are designed to be administered face-to-face -face and cannot be delivered remotely. This created unique challenges during the periods of school closure and hybrid distant learning situations. Similar to other states, the Nevada Department of Education implemented temporary guidance that allowed school districts to identify potential English learners provisionally in order to ensure access to English learner services until that formal face-to-face -face EL screening assessment could be administered. Second, as with many other students, English learners face the challenges of having access to technology, connectivity, and quality learning opportunities during periods of school closure and when parents were provided distant learning opportunities or distant learning options. Many school districts moved quickly to ensure that every student had access to a personal technology device and connectivity. They also provided professional learning activities to help teachers design their instructional activities specifically to engage English learners in oral and written language development. Third, some school districts identified concerns about drops in EL enrollment during COVID-19 these same districts reported that they organized communication efforts to contact families directly to encourage both enrollment and either in-person attendance at school or participation in distant, distant learning um, when the districts had that as a, an option. And fourth, COVID-19 had a significant impact on stability, including employment, housing, access to food and other social services. It appears that these impacts were even greater for low-income families and the families of English learners. To address these concerns, school and district staff were assigned to contact families to help determine individual needs and identify specific services and other resources to address the identified needs. We also recognize that COVID had a significant impact on the state assessment system. No academic assessments were completed for the 2019-20 school year due to the pandemic. 
the U.S. Department of Education and the Governor signed executive orders that aligned with the not assessing during the 2019-20 school year. The results for the 2020-21 school year reflect a lower participation rate, again due to the pandemic. The NDE Office of Assessment, Data and Accountability Management, ADAM, has messaged that we should not try to compare the 2020-21 assessment results to previous years as they would not be representative of the trends provided. Ideally, they have stated the most relevant comparisons would be made with this current year's assessment, 2021-22, which will not be completed and available in terms of accountability results until mid-September 2022. As we take a look at assessment results and going to the pre-COVID period, this table reflects the percentage of English learners achieving adequate growth percentile for English language proficiency as measured by the annual WIDA assessment. As mentioned, the EL participation in WIDA assessments was impacted in 2019-20 and 2020-21 school years. As we take a look at this table, the data compares WIDA AGP of English learners in Clark and Washoe Zoom schools, the left-hand side of the graph, with English learners in Title I schools not identified as Zoom schools, the center part of the graph, these schools have a comparable rate of low income as Zoom schools, but fewer English learner students. And then on the right-hand side of the graph represents non-Title I schools not identified as Zoom schools. In other words, these schools have a much lower rate of low income and a much lower percentage of English learners. Two things that we would like to highlight. The overall percentage of WIDA AGP for the period of 2017 to 2019 was higher in the Clark and Washoe Zoom schools than in the Title I non-Zoom schools those that had similar poverty but fewer English learners for the same period. The second note is that when we compare the Zoom schools, higher poverty and higher percentages of English learners with non-Title I, non-Zoom schools, in other words, low poverty schools and low percentage English learners, the WIDA AGP for 2019 was higher for Zoom schools 51.3% compared to that of the non-Title I, non-Zoom schools at 41.4%. The Nevada State Legislature enacted Assembly Bill 195 in 2021. Of the new requirements related to English learners, I will highlight three major components that were outlined in a guidance memo from the Nevada Department of Education to local school districts and the State Public Charter School Authority. AB 195 was already mentioned by uh, representatives of NAS in terms of some of the concerns that they had. The three components that I would like to highlight is that local school districts and charter school authority are to annually report data to the Nevada Department of Education regarding English learner achievement their participation in programs and activities, and educator preparation. Second, schools and school districts are to provide information regarding English learner pupil and parental rights in the five most common languages other than English on the school or district website. Um, and the Nevada Department of Education is charged to provide translations in the five most common languages in Nevada, in other, in other words, Spanish, Tagalog, Chinese Zongwen, Vietnamese, and Amharic, and we've provided those. We want to thank Clark County School District, who provided assistance with the language translation 
in order to provide that information in translated forms to other school districts. The third area is that AB 195 requires districts to develop plans to accompany their district EL policies to ensure that the implementation of their policies are enacted. Assembly Bill 219 was enacted by the Nevada State Legislature in 2019 and it outlined specific requirements for English learners. Of the major components, the identification of schools in which the academic achievement of English learners was in the lowest 30% of schools in the state were identified for corrective action and required to develop corrective action plans or improvement plans. Those plans were to include a needs assessment to analyze data and identify root causes of low achievement for English learners, establish goals related to English learner achievement, and then identify specific strategies and action steps that address the root causes identified in the needs assessment process. Four high schools that are identified for corrective action, they need to allow parents of English learners the option to transfer their student to another high school that has not been identified for corrective action under AB 219 if there are other high schools in that situation that are available. In the fall of 2019, the Nevada Department of Education sent a guidance memo, guidance memo number 19-07 to LEAs or local education agencies. In that guidance memo, it outlined the requirements of Assembly Bill 19 and also the list of schools identified for corrective action for each school district. In follow-up, schools completed and submitted their corrective action plans to the Nevada Department of Education. Because of COVID-19, the annual achievement assessments were canceled, as mentioned, in the spring of 2020. In the fall of 2020, NDE did not have achievement data with which to evaluate Assembly Bill 219 CAP school progress or to identify new schools. Guidance memo number 20-04 notified the school districts that NDE would maintain the same AB 219 CAP schools that were identified in 2019 and that those schools should revisit English learner needs and progress and continue the implementation of the AB 219 corrective action plan strategies to improve the academic achievement of English learners. Because of the lingering effects of COVID-19, the student participation rate on annual achievement assessments in the spring of 2021 was significantly impacted. In the fall of 2021, NDE determined that it would not be prudent to use spring 2021 assessment results to evaluate AB 219 CAP school progress or to identify new schools. Guidance memo 21-05 notified school districts that NDE would maintain the same AB 219 CAP schools that were identified in 2019 and again that schools should revisit the EL strategies, uh, excuse me, uh, strategies and activities to address the needs of their English learner academic achievement needs. I would now like to introduce Lorna James Cervantes, Chair of the English Mastery Council. The Nevada State Legislature established the English Mastery Council and defined its membership in 2013. And at this time, uh, I'll turn the time over to, to Lorna James Cervantes. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Lorna James Cervantes, uh, current chair of the English Mastery Council, and I've served on the council for the past, I think, six years um, as a former associate superintendent in the Clark County School District. The English Mastery Council 
completes annual reviews of the district policies and plans to ensure that they're aligned with expectations in the law. It, this has been an important step that has taken a great deal of time by the members to, they have reviewed each individual district plan and provided feedback to the districts as to how the plans could be improved. Uh, even when uh, some districts said, well, we only have a very limited number of ELs in our district or we currently don't have any ELs in our district, we still pushed back and, and said, no, you still have to have a policy and have a plan in place to meet the needs of any students who are in your district, even if it's a small number, or for any future students who are going to come into your district, you have to have a plan and be prepared to meet the needs of all students in your district. Also, in order to better prepare pre-service teachers to meet the needs of the English language learners, the EMC made specific recommendations to the State Board of Education and the Commission on Professional Standards regarding coursework that included, that should be included in the ELAD endorsement for teachers who are going through higher education in the state of Nevada. Uh, the Nevada Nevada's public colleges and universities are at varying levels of implementation as they work to integrate the ELAD coursework and other classes. It should be noted that Nevada State College was really an early adopter of this work. They integrated the coursework into uh, various classes at their college and have, have really worked over the years to, to be some of the earliest adopters of this work UNLV has also worked and uh, done uh, similar work, but they are further along and all of the universities are further along with implementing the ELAD endorsement in their elementary coursework than in the secondary coursework where a lot of the classes are more specific to subject content area. And finally, uh, to assist teachers in implementing Nevada's English language development standards, the EMC recommended that NDE develop an instructional framework. Several members of the English Mastery Council have served in a consultative capacity. And so this goes back to the fact that we have adopted now the WIDA English Language Development Standards as the English Language Development Standards for the entire state of Nevada. And the framework is really created to help teachers to understand how do I teach both math and English at the same time? Because teacher, teachers have to understand better how to teach the children both English and the language of their content area at the same time they're teaching content. So this framework is developed to assist with that. The purpose of the ELD framework is to assist the teachers to more effectively design and deliver instruction that builds English language skills and provides equitable access to rigorous content for English learners. One of the instincts that sometimes teachers have is if students are struggling with their English language development, they will go to a, a lower rigor level in their content area instruction. And so that framework helps them not to fall into that trap of reducing expectations for students, but rather holding them to grade level expectations while still developing their English language development skills. And at this time, we want to thank you for the opportunity to present with you today and to open the floor to questions, or I think Sylvia is going <laughs> to go next. Well, I don't want to. I, I, maybe you want to hold the questions until the end, uh, Senator. Yeah, I, I was going to say we're going to we'll, we'll hold the questions till the end, and then um, hopefully um, everybody's still available. I know uh, Dr. Parton has to go off, but um, um, okay. I know the Clark County um, EL um, is is it was there. So yeah, if you would go ahead and do your presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sylvia Lasos. I'm a professor of law, and for the last five years, I've been working with the Nevada Immigrant Coalition. Uh, which is made up of about 20 groups, mostly located in uh, southern Nevada, all of whom provide services or do advocacy work for immigrant populations. And they include, for example, the, um, the Lawyers Group for, for Immigration, the UNLV Immigration Clinic, Catholic Charities, uh, Mi Familia Vota, Make the Road Nevada. These are groups that you have encountered through, through your legislative work. And we do, I, I kind of want to underscore that we do have consensus when we do legislative advocacy. It's not like um, 
uh, someone goes off on their own, but we have a process of building consensus so that every organization feels uh, comfortable with the positions that we take in the legislature uh, at the CCSD level and at the Nevada Department of Education. So what you have heard from the previous testimony is kind of a report back to you of you wrote this law and this is how we're trying to comply with this law and this is where we would critique the law. And our posi my presentation, the, the presentation of the Nevada Immigrant Coalition is the view of the community. So as a community group, community advocate, what we come to report to you is this is what we see in our community. This is how we see our children and our families struggle. This is how COVID impacted us. And this is where we need your help. Because truly, and I'm, I'm sorry if I get emotional about this, truly, truly our children need help. And truly it is the job of the Nevada legislature to maintain the system of public schools. That's the bottom line, the buck stops with you. I know there's a lot of activity over here with the trustees and all that stuff, but really the buck stops with you. You provide financing, you provide laws, you provide guidance, and when our children suffer, as they're suffering now, you are the most logical body to go to and ask for help. And that's why I'm here, I'm asking for help. Now the testimony that I have written, um, and I apologize, I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade, that means I like words a lot and text a lot. Uh, but what these words are saying is kind of telling a story of how the community has struggled, tried to work with CCSD and the Department of Education as they see our children and families struggle. And it started with closing down of schools, remote learning, uh, connectivity. We have to say that the most positive, wonderful thing that has happened uh, due to COVID is the wonderful work that we were able to do with Connecting Kids Nevada. You know, thank goodness for that effort, for the responsiveness of the government, for the responsiveness of the Nevada legislature. But it's one thing to provide Chromebooks and it's another thing to do remote learning. Remote learning was difficult. It was taxing. Many children were not able to do the work required under remote learning. And this is what our parents told us. So I'm also reporting on a series of three town halls that Mi Familia Vota with the auspiceship of Councilwoman Olivia Diaz and Trustee Linda Cavazos and Trustee Irene Cepeda you know, we organized these town halls originally to uh, try to provide feedback to CCSD on how they should spend $1.2 billion. But it became kind of a place for the community to talk about their concerns. So what were they talking about? They were talking about remote learning being so hard. They were talking about their observations that teachers were burned out and wanted to figure out, wanted to ask that this money be used to help teachers. Um, they talked about, again, you know, the different conditions for these schools compared to other schools. A lot of teacher vacancies, facilities with dirty drinking fountains, leaky roofs, conditions that continue to exist today uh, when children go to school. Now, as uh, we reported all this back to, and, and also that the students particularly talked about uh, the phrase that I remember, estamos locos. And maybe one thing that you take home tonight is, uh, honey, yo no estoy loca. Loca means crazy, you know? So children were telling us at the Desert Pine Town Hall, we don't feel quite right you know, please to attend to emotional behavior, the suffering, oh, a little girl broke down and cried about, she talked about her suffering. And uh, one of the young youngsters simply talked about, please make school fun. Please help my colleagues re-engage in school and see school as a fun activity as opposed to the drudgery of remote learning. All of this we communicated to Clark County School District so that some of this $1.2 billion be used to 
attend to what the community was saying they needed to help their kids back to school. Um, I'm sorry to report that not a lot of our conversation was really incorporated into the ARP planning uh, that CCSD put together and was approved. And I do think that some of the situations that we see right, right now are a result of investments that coulda, woulda, shoulda made. But we're here right now in 2022 and we need to be looking forward. So the next thing I want to turn to is uh, the data. Now, Carl is totally correct that the uh, that data is kind of fuzzy. It's kind of like not really good data because, of, of course, so many students didn't come back to do SBAC. Uh, you know, I think Clark County had like 50% of the students do uh, testing. Uh, families were supposed to bring their kids in for WIDA testing, and families said, hello, there's COVID, and when am I supposed to do that if I'm working 24-7 just to put make sure I don't get evicted tonight. You know, so the testing and data results that we have are funky. Let's just be bottom line. But what we do have is highly concerning. And the Nevada Immigrant Coalition has communicated to the Department of Education our concerns around the data, such as they are. And we have asked them to monitor, to take a close look at this, and to continue to be on top of this data, which is frankly shocking. And if they, any representation of the truth, right? Data is supposed to represent somehow reality. When data are funky, then you're not quite sure. But if there's any possibility that this data represents reality, then we're in a really bad place. And there should be red flags just kind of going off all the time um, at every level. So one of the things that we were concerned about is why are KEL kids missing? Where are they? I mean, kids, we know that our community has not shrunk. We know that the immigrant community didn't go to uh, Indiana. They stayed here. So why are we have 6,400 missing students, and why in the course of five years is this kind of declining slope, particularly at CCSD of ELL counts? Because when you don't identify an ELL child, that child does not receive services and the state does not receive Title III funding, and the state doesn't distribute per pupil funding to the school districts to help the students. So this count is actually very important, and in civil rights law is a, a very kind of clear guideline. You've got to do this right, because if you don't do that right, there's not gonna be services for these children. So one of our great flat red flags that we started off on is why are you losing kids? Right, Carl gave some explanations. I think it's gonna be crucial to see if we continue to see what we see in the next testing period, if we continue to lose kids or we recover. But let me point out to you that other school districts are trying to figure out where those kids went to. I mean, it's not a magic show. Kids don't disappear. I'm telling you that our immigrant community has not contracted. So this effort of going out to reach out and finding out to these kids is something that must be done, period. Because when you don't count somebody, they're falling through the cracks. And that's the concern that I'm bringing to you. There are three vulnerable communities because of COVID. IEP kids, extremely vulnerable. ELL, who are about 80% high poverty, uh, and we have the African-American community, if you look at their data, it's just god-awful as well. I'm here to testify on behalf of the Nevada immigrant on one of those three, which is the ELL. But the data is god-awful. I'll point to you know what I analyzed from the Nevada report card and the SBAC data on math and English non-proficiency is shocking. We're in the high 90s, non-proficient in reading and in math for ELL children. Non-ELL children are also doing god-awful, you know, 54%, 56% non-proficient. But think about the testimony that you heard earlier today. Can any child get a trade, be an apprentice if they're not reading and can't do math? My brother-in-law, is a carpenter and he does algebra in his head all the time. How do we get these kids that are off track and scoring so low 
in this last year to get back on track to be a productive member of our society. That's why I'm here, and that's the red flag that I'm pointing to you. Now, let's pray that that was an aberration, but the trend is not good. And again, when you go to the community and you talk to parents, uh, parents will tell you remote learning was a disaster. I couldn't keep track. It was La Hermanita who was keeping track. Our kids were working at McDonald's, putting up their phone, pretending they were in class, and serving French fries. You know, so again, what we're saying is these scores, maybe they're totally off, but what we know from our community is that we are highly concerned about checking, about catching up this particular group, ELLs. All right. Um, let me just kind of gather my thoughts, because again, I've got, become emotional. It's a whole generation that we're talking about. I guess the last piece of data, which I think is, is pretty firm, is the graduation rates. We started when we uh, changed kind of the graduation requirements 2016 to 2017. There was no difference between ELL and non-ELL graduation rates. We were high, you know, very high 90s, you know, something to be proud of as the state of Nevada. And if you look at the divergence now, we're now 13 points behind the ELLs. Now, kids who do not graduate don't get an apprenticeship program. Kids who do not graduate will have lower lifetime earnings. Kids who do not graduate are more likely to ask for benefits from the state welfare system. So this 13-point gap is highly alarming, not just for our community, but for the state as a whole. Okay, so what are our recommendations? Are kind of like, Nevada legislature, please help. Uh, Please pay attention to this. These are red flags that we can't uh, just let go. So there are several things. We do need to monitor the data. We do need to make sure that this kind of red flag indication, is it or isn't it an indication of reality? You know, so we have a mechanism is this body asking the Department of Education to continue its work of monitoring the data and telling you what's happening with assessments and what's happening with the disappearing magic act of ELL children. Are we gonna see it again? We just did SBACs, right? Just got through SBACs. I mean, are we gonna see these drops again? So monitoring and delegating to Carl, who's a hard worker, I hate to give him more work, but you know, they're the ones that do the job. Not us, they're the ones. So we wanna make sure to ask you uh, to do that. The second thing we wanna ask you to do is, who is monitoring this $1.2 billion that came to us for the purpose that I'm pleading with you right now to help get these kids back on track? Why aren't we using that money to figure out where the ELL kids went to or the black kids? Why do they have 50% chronic absenteeism? Why are these SBAC uh, scores so low? Who's tutoring them? Yeah, that's a big question because we don't have enough teachers to do anything. Uh, so please help us monitor where this $1.2 billion is going to and whether it's really helping the kids the way they need to be helped. We know the data now, right? That plan was made like eight months ago, or in September, I don't know how many months that is. But we know now in a more solid, concrete way what the red flags, the wounds are, and where that money should be going. We don't get to decide it's the LEA, but you can engage the LEAs in a conversation. Community groups don't really have power. I'm telling you, we go to the CCSD trust meetings. We're not listened to. You have the purse strings. You have the Nevada constitutional authority. Please ask this question as to what's happening with the ARP money. I also want to ask you to think about the per pupil funding formula. We took all this Zoom and Victory money, put it into the per pupil funding formula. We know that Zoom and Victory was for the poorest children, the worst performing schools, the geographic locations that are racially segregated. I don't know what the funding picture is gonna look like in 2022 and I don't pretend to know. I do pretend to plea with you, 
from an advocacy standpoint and point out to you that Zoom and Victory were excellent programs, had great ROI. He just explained to you how wonderful these programs have been. And it's not because you gave teachers a sack of money. It's because it was a system reform to better serve the most vulnerable students of the state of Nevada. It was professional learning. It was retention of kids. It was pre-K. And it was third grade literacy, fourth grade literacy, fifth grade literacy, so that from K through five, we maximized the number of kids that were reading at proficiency. It was and is a great program. Please, let's not do what Nevada does over and over again. Come up with great ideas, great programs, and then scrap them and move on to the next whatever. These kids need this now. Not five years from now or 10 years from now. The struggle is now. I want to point out to you as well, please, and this is my, I think it's my last point, but that the pre-K program from Zoom is really like the best thing going since apple pie. Uh, all the data from CCSD, which I don't think that Carl has provided to you, is that this program is highly, highly successful for ELL kids and for kids um, that would struggle with literacy because of the word content of their home. Zoom seats represent 8% of total uh, pre-K seats in the state of Nevada. So if we don't find a, way of con find a way of at least continuing pre-K Zoom, we're going to lose a very important asset that really serves the most vulnerable community that we have. So please keep in mind that this is a gem. Let's not, again, throw it away because we've got a new program going on. Um, so I think that's all I have to um, plea with you. Forgive me for making so many pleas uh, on behalf of our community. I guess I do have one last idea is that we have so many kids off track, we have to tutor them and maybe we need to give them more time to graduate. Uh, I know that's an expense, but we have to be realistic about the fact that we have kids that are just haven't gotten back on track. I personally don't see this as a problem that's a one year problem. I see this as a problem of maybe two, three, four, five years, something that we're gonna have to address for this whole generation that missed out on a whole bunch of learning and had a pretty traumatic year in 2021, 2022, coming back to school. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I think, I believe that's all our presentation. So um, we've got a great group that we could ask questions of if we have any questions. Uh, I, um, I, I, just one, I, I, and I, cause I hadn't seen this on a, on a, on a uh, printed uh, was in the one presentation, I believe that the department, um, when you talked about the funding, um, especially like for uh, Zoom, um, I hadn't seen that figure where, um, I knew how much we had put in in the past, but the, the, the increased amount, I think it was like, what was it? $35,000, $35 million more per year for English language learners, is that correct? I don't have that in front of me. I switched. So that was, uh, yeah, that's about what it was. Carl slide Wilson. Five, <clears throat> slide five, I think. Carl Wilson for the record, yes. And slide five. Um, Is that the one you were referring yes, to? Yes, that one. Yes, Carl Wilson for the record. So when we take a look at the amount of funding that uh, was appropriated for this biennium, uh, the amount that is to go to the EL weighting is $85 million. And that's a combination of what used to be the Zoom program funding plus a part of the funding that was previously dedicated to SB 178 that also helped 
uh, sort of English learners who were not in Zoom schools or Victory schools. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I just, I, I mean, that just to me, at this point, I hadn't seen it on, I actually printed out. So I think that hopefully that that's something that, um, um, you know, because I agree, Zoom's been very successful and, and we've been able to help um, a certain portion of the population of English language learners. Um, but, you know, the, the hope is that we can now start helping even more kids with, with that. But that wouldn't have worked if, if we were doing the same amount of money and just spreading it, you know, um, spreading it thinner. And uh, um, so I think that that, uh, um, but I, you know, I, I think we have to watch carefully to see what happens there now as, as we, you know, with the new funding formula, and to make sure we're not losing the good things that we've been doing with Zoom, um, but then also be able to help these other kids in a way that's meaningful. And so is, is somebody at the, at the department, is, I mean, how are you watching that? Carl Wilson for the record. So uh, part of the mechanism that is in place is that as we reach the end of the school year, then each of the districts will report how they actually used the, the EL waiting funding in terms of uh, how many students served, what were the, the services that they provided, and so forth. So, okay. So we'll definitely be looking to see how that how that's gone. And of course, we got the pandemic on top of that. That's kind of disrupted the way we normally would have done things. Um, but uh, okay, thank you. Um, other questions? Yeah, some Lumen Miller. Thank you, Chair. And um, my question for, thank you for the presentation. My question for the department is when I'm looking at slide seven in this presentation, yes. And so I just have some, some questions about uh, the data as, as we're hearing that students are disappearing. And so we look at the three different years. And so it looks like just at first glance that Clark County students had actually increased Washoe, we see a dip, but Washoe is about a third of the amount of students being served as Clark. And then in the charter schools and other districts, so first I should ask, does other districts mean our rural districts? Are we putting charter and rules together? Because we do see an increase over the past three years, and but still overall they're about a quarter of what um, the number of students that are being served. So my first question would be, what do, how do we account for that increase in the charter and rural districts? Is that from students leaving Washoe and Clark? Because again, those numbers still pretty much stay steady. And also when it comes to the funding, has it been equitable if we look at between, because often, and it's no secret, Clark feels it's not getting its equitable share when it comes to certain funding. So do, because I noticed we don't see dollar amounts attached to this. So what would the dollar amounts be for the other, for Washoe and then the other districts compared to, um, and I know we say per pupil, but again, we also know that when we're looking at class size and school size in Clark compared to class size and school size in our other districts, uh, there's a discrepancy there. So if you could shed some light on that, please. Yes, Carl Wilson for the record. So when we take a look at the number of students served by Clark, Washoe, and then yes, we have combined other districts, all other districts besides Clark and Washoe and the State Public Charter School Authority in that band that in the table is identified in the peach color. Um, this is according to the annual reports that they submit to us. The, the funding that was available under the Zoom School EL funding program was actually allocated to all districts and the Charter Authority on a per English learner uh, formula. And so Clark and Washoe and the other districts and the Charter Authority received the same amount per English learner. It's just that as you can imagine, the number of English learners in Clark and Washoe was much higher than the rural school districts and other school districts and the charter authority. 
uh, part of what you see in this is that Clark made the choice early on to serve fewer schools but more intensely. In other words, to put more funding per English learner into the Zoom schools that were the low performing schools with the high concentrations of English learners than we saw in Washoe or in the others. And so we saw um, across Washoe and across the other school districts, oftentimes the spreading out of the funds to more schools uh, and more students. And the number of students served in Clark and Washoe, these are school level um, initiatives. And so the number of students served would be all of the students in those schools. So for example, the preschool program or the reading center program or the extended day is not available just to English learners in the Zoom schools in Clark and Washoe, but available to all students in the designated Zoom schools. And so that impacts the data that you're looking at. Follow-up, Chair? Yeah, go ahead. And, and so with that, thank you for that clarification. With that, when I'm still looking at the increase because we don't, and I know it's not aggregated out in a way that we can see if actual, if there was student movement, student transferring, or even student um, enrollment increases in, in these other districts. But it seems like it, you know, close to almost doubled. So would that, is there a propensity to imagine that that was because of more accurate identifying and data collection or has that not been looked at? It, it, is there actually that shift that happened? Carl Wilson for the record. So if we're referring specifically to the other districts and the charter school authority, it actually, as you can see, that there was the decision to expand to additional schools in terms of the funding that they had, which resulted in more students being uh, impacted through th those decisions that were made at the local school district level. Okay, thank you. And one final question, um, I, I continue to ask this question and I will continue and continue to ask this question, but according to Assembly Bill, um, what is it, 269, I'm sorry. Assembly Bill 219 that was referenced during the presentation too, um, one of the requirements was to offer these, um, these tests, these uh, assessments in the languages provided for the students. And again, as, as it was said, Clark County, you know, students speak almost 100 languages. So I'm just wondering, where is that movement to, because this was passed in 2019, to offer because while we talk about data and fuzzy data, another thing we know is that we have students that if, you know, if you come into a school at a certain age and you haven't had the time to acquire the academic English language, but yet you have the skills and the ability and education from your previous uh, schools in your first language, that you very well could be performing very well on these tests, but it's just not, we're not able to obtain that because you're taking a test in another language. You know, if I was to go right now to name any different country and test me in another language, it's going to show an absolute different picture of my academic um, ability or achievement. So I was just wondering, when will we be there where we can actually test students in, in their strongest language, I'll say? Carl Wilson for the record. So I would need to check back with our assessment department. I know that in conversations with them over the last few years, it's my understanding that some of the assessments that we use in terms of our annual assessments, such as the SBAC and so forth, have not been available in other languages. But I would need to check back to see if uh, what is the status on that in terms of uh, moving the direction of of that requirement. Okay. It's all right. Are you good? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Just want to make sure. Do you have any other questions?
Okay. Um, uh, we have Assemblywoman Bill Bray after all. Thank you. My colleague was keeping us guessing. Um, thank you so much for being here, um, all of you, and thank you for your presentation and and um, and to Sylvia Lasso's uh, your passion for the subject just always is very inspiring to me. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask sort of about what you talked about, um, but I'm going to ask it of um, Dr. Moore, who is up north. Um, I think it is really important that we um, watch that billion dollars that A or pay that escrow money, and I know it's coming through the department. So I guess I, I would ask, what are you? What can the department do to have transparency so we can see where the money is being spent? And I think it's important that um, the legislative body does, but I also think it's important that the citizens see that as well. Um, I know that's a lot of of concern of constituents of mine is yes, we are getting this influx of money, but we want to see where it's spent. We want data driven results and we want to see um, what happens. And for so long we hear you can't just throw money at the problem. Well, we're going to try it this one time, right? And maybe it, maybe this is going to work. So um, I just, if Dr. Moore could come up and just talk about what is in place, what needs to be in place, how can we help you? Um, create the transparency that people feel like they can actually um, know where the money's going. Jonathan Moore, for the record, Jonathan thank you, uh, record. Vice Chair thank Bilberry you. Axelrod, for the question. So currently the department is in the initial phase of partnering um, with a vendor to develop a dashboard of all federal relief funding. And so that will be publicly available uh, across the three uh, buckets of federal relief funding. And so we're in the early stages. Um, that contract was recently approved, um, and so we'll begin work on that. So that'll be one vehicle uh, by which Nevadans will have access to federal relief funds and how they're being spent across the state. Also, as an ancillary resource, uh, not as close to Nevada, the Edunomic Center um, through Georgetown University under the leadership of Dr. Marguerite Rosa, the noted uh, Dr. Marguerite Rosa, has launched a, a 50 state uh, dashboard, a 50 state comparison dashboard. Uh, they do have Nevada's data represented, um, at least the earlier parts of that data lags because there's no direct reporting structure to them, so they compile their data based on other sources that are available. Uh, but in terms of our Nevada-specific dashboard, we are in the process of working on that. That contract was just approved, and so we're engaged in conversations with the vendor to start the harvesting of data uh, in order to build that platform. Can you restate um, the, the Georgetown data that you were talking about? Jonathan Moore, for the, the, the record. dashboard, I believe. Yes, Mr. Chairman. So through uh, the Edgenomics Center at Georgetown University, and I can certainly share this with committee staff, uh, Dr. Marguerite Rosa uh, leads the Edgenomics Center uh, at Georgetown University, and they have published a 50-state comparison uh, dashboard to highlight um, the expenditures of the federal relief funds. Um, and so uh, in that site, on that dashboard, you are able to click and see Nevada's data, as I mentioned, uh, because they're an external source and there's no direct reporting to them. Uh, there may be some lags or inconsistency with that data as they capture it through multiple sources, um, I believe, but that is an ancillary resource um, that people can start to look at um, in anticipation of our specific dashboard being completed. Um, we have done, uh, Senator Don Derloop. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll send that link to all of you. Okay, um, other questions. Um, do, do we still have um, uh, uh, Ignacio Ruiz on the line? Yes, Mr. Chair, this is Ignacio Ruiz. Thank you. Oh, good. Um, so um, I know you didn't. Uh, you didn't. You're available for questions. Um, is there anything that came up that uh, uh, that you wanted to respond to in any of the questions or testimony that was given? Uh, actually, a couple of things. There was uh, some comments around Title Three funding. I just want to make sure that it's noted. Uh, our Title Three funding did not decrease uh, from the COVID uh, 
COVID year to uh, to our current year, uh, our Title III dollars have remained uh, basically at the same levels that we had uh, during the during the pandemic. Um, the other piece is that we have increased from uh, the year of 2021 uh, to 2021-22 of this year, we have increased our number of English learners by 1,600 students. Uh, so we are, are starting to see those numbers uh, rise uh, to the uh, pre-pandemic pre pre-pandemic number, excuse me, that we had, which was approximately about 52,000. Just want to make sure that we uh, to, to to note that. Thank you. And and is that increase because they're able to test them now, and and whereas because they're back in school or do? Ignacio Reese, for the record, Mr. Chair. I would, there would, you know, several factors. Part of that is, the, is what would be the testing. The other piece would be just opening up our schools um, and being able to, you know, have in-person learning. Um, although during the pandemic, if students were not tested, although uh, if they were identified as having another language in their in the home, uh, we the guidance to our schools as well as the guidance coming from the state was that they would receive English learner services. So they still continue to receive services, although they may have not officially been uh, assessed, as long as there was a, a language other than English identified during, pre, during registration, et cetera, uh, the, the, the guidance to schools. And as a district, we provided those uh, English learner services as well. Great, thank you. Any other questions of any of our presenters? I'm not hearing um, uh, some woman um, Hansen in Carson because I can't see C Carson. Did you have any questions? Uh, Chair, no, I don't think Sorry. there are. Not from me. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and a some woman uh, Hardy. I didn't see you shaking your head that you wanted to or raising your hand. I just want to make sure I didn't miss you in there. I'm good for now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, thank you all very much. Some amazing um, information. Be very helpful as we move forward, especially uh, in, in recommendations that we want for the next legislative session. So thank you very much, and thank you for being patient um, and waiting and uh, presenting. So thank you. With that, uh, we will now go to um, agenda item number eight, presentation on jobs for Nevada's graduates in this program. And we have the executive director, um, Renee Contu, is here. Um, to do a presentation. And whenever you're ready, go ahead. Just make sure you identify as, you know, yourself for the record. How do I? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair and honorable members of the committee. I'll just take a second here and uh, put our presentation up. My name, for the record, is Renee Cantu. I am the executive director <clears throat> of Jobs for Nevada Graduates, or JAG, as many know us. Uh, and I'm joined here with my colleague. Uh, I'll let her introduce herself as well. Hi, my name is uh, Maria Romero, and I am uh, the program coordinator for the Jobs for Nevada's graduates here in Southern Nevada, serving the east side of Clark County. Thank you, Maria. So, uh, so it's it's a pleasure this afternoon to provide you with an update about Jobs for Nevada graduates. Uh, I've asked Maria to join me so that we can uh, work in tandem to give you an update about the program, as well as to introduce anybody who might be less familiar with Jobs for Nevada graduates about the work that we're doing, and we and how we fit into the whole kind of educational and state landscape. So I titled the presentation "Helping Students Reconnect to School and Achieve the Highest Outcomes." And uh, I will begin first. Hang on, let me move to the next slide. There it is. I wanted to talk a little bit about the rebrand just for a second. Uh, all of you, many of you have known us as JAG Nevada for many, many years. Uh, we were established in 2013 by the state of Nevada to serve the public good by helping students to graduate and to find a career pathway. Uh, at the time, you know, and perhaps still now, our, our dropout rates are unacceptably high, and we were seen as a solution uh, to help assist with that. So JAG Nevada, uh, when we did community focus groups with various people, they told us they did not know what JAG stood for, 
or perhaps they thought that we were part of the military or other things, which is just not what we are. Uh, it, 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 JAG stands for Jobs for America's Graduate, which is our national organization. So they, uh, the, the, these focus groups and the folks that we worked with recommended that we go with our actual name, which is Jobs for Nevada's Graduates. And so it communicates a lot about who we are and what we do. Uh, so the J4NG logo I especially love because it has a, an image of the state of Nevada with the number four, and it tells you what we're about. We're for Nevada. So I love that little image where it's, you know, for Nevada, which is what we're about. So as a quick summary, Maria's going to tell you a little bit about what JAG is uh, and how we operate in the schools, uh, and we'll also give you some examples of students and lots of, and lots of data. So... Moving on to the next slide, Maria, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Cantu. Maria Romero, for the record. Uh, what is J4NG now is our acronym for Jobs for Nevada's graduates. Uh, JAG is a state-based nonprofit dedicated to supporting young people of great promise operating in 40 states. Uh, J4NG is an independent Nevada affiliate that implements the highly effective JAG model. J4NG mission is to inspire, support, and mentor students to create a powerful and positive future, and we do that every day in the classroom. Uh, J4NG was created by the state to increase the graduation and workforce pathway entry rates of Nevada's Youth of Promise. We deliver the Jack Advantage uh, project-based learning. That's uh, our focus pretty much uh, starting this year, trauma-informed care, and uh, what is uh, in employer. employer engagement? Employer engagement, yes. So, uh, our base is pretty much to take care of the kids as a whole, right? Uh, not only the competencies that we teach in the classroom, but also take care of you know their you know what is going on in their personal lives with their families, and also uh, provide employment for our students, employment opportunities coming to the classrooms. J4NG teaches 87 work readiness and social, emotional, and personal development competencies in the classrooms. Uh, J4NG is a work readiness class, so we prepare students for a successful transition from high school to the workforce, college, and, and beyond. Uh, we also have a career association or club and mentoring after school, and we are part of the wraparound program in every school, so we take care of our students, not only in the classroom, but outside, and we partner with the school to provide the services that the students need in the classroom and outside the classroom as well. Uh, how does J4NG or Jobs for Nevada's graduates work? J4NG maintains an MOU with 14 school districts to deliver services directly in the high school, so we are and the high schools providing those services, as I mentioned before, uh, we are an elective class. J4NG specialists are embedded in the high schools, teach uh, JAC classes, and deliver the JAC model to 45 to 60 students, sometimes more, and they report to school full time. So all our specialists are in the classroom, like a regular teacher, you know, from the time that school begins until school ends how our recruitment looks like. So uh, when we recruit students for our program, uh, it's students who really have the need for the services that we provide, and then we see that they will benefit uh, for these services. And of course, one of the key components is how the students really want to be a part of this program, because it's not only you know a class in the classroom, it's also a leadership uh, class that we include with this as well. Uh, they are invited to interview as they join the J4NG program to ensure that they know what the program is all about. And uh, the expectations, our goal, of course, is to help them graduate and obtain the credits needed for graduation. Target, we target disengaged students, students with high absenteeism, low grades, credit deficiency, of course, is one of our biggest ones, and disciplinary issues and role. J4NG helps them to turn things around uh, and to find, you know, pathways after graduation and even in school. It, we also have a school advisory committee that assists specialists 
us to identify and recruit and select students, that will be, uh, you know, the best fit for a program. Or not really that. That will really, really benefit for the services that we that we provide. Thank, you. thank you, Maria Rene Cantu. For the record, uh, I wanted to touch briefly on the problem. You know, the problems that we face in the school, and they are myriad, as you very well know, on this committee. You know, COVID has widened existing inequities and effects, and those effects persist post-COVID. So this information on this slide is from the Nevada Advisory Committee to the Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, the first point that they make is that children are impacted by family circumstances, as you've heard today. Uh, so wraparound services like J4NG for them and their families must be made available. Wraparound is absolutely essential. Uh, Second, students experience learning loss for a range of reasons. It will be important, I think, as we move forward to treat mental health issues, family circumstances, and learning loss concurrently because each is serious and interrelated. At Jobs for Nevada graduates, we, we work with a student holistically and uh, are able to assist uh, not just in terms of academic assistance, uh, but also with regard to social emotional mentoring support so that students are engaged in their education. Like somebody said before, making school fun, uh, you know, I know that my eighth grader loves school because he loves to go to band at Walter Johnson. You know, so they have to have a sense of belonging to something. So one, a caring adult, the JAG specialist, not that there aren't others, but they're able to spend extra time with those students, and two, kind of a sense of family that they get from each other. Uh, the, the JAG students become a family, as you well know, Ms. Romero. Uh, parents relied on older siblings to care for younger children during COVID, as we heard before. Many of those, these students disappeared from school. Uh, ELL students had difficulties with distance learning, as did IEP and 504 students. And we serve a, a gamut of students with all different kinds of backgrounds. Uh, on average, the students that enter JAG have an average of seven barriers to success. So that includes economic, familial, socioeconomic and academic barriers. So we work with students who are facing, you know, kind of multiple, multiple barriers to their success and are able to get them back on track. At present, the effects of COVID's devastation on Nevada's youth continues to manifest in increased violence, mental health issues, and disengagement from school. On the next slide, I, I was looking at some information from the Centers for Disease Control, just in terms of the morale of our students. So part of the problem is students are still in crisis. You know, it's, you know, I, I, I think about COVID as the collision, the car crash. And I think about what's happening this year as when you're in a car crash, if you've ever been in one, there's the collision and then there's everything in the car that was not tied down, the second collision hitting you on the back of the head. And it's almost as if this year, you know, for our students, it's kind of that secondary collision that's impacting them. So according to this report from the Centers for Disease Control, 55% of youth, and this is national information, experienced abuse at home. Uh, and this is self-reported. 11% experienced physical abuse. 35% reported that someone in the home had lost their job. More than half reported feelings of hopelessness. Uh, and 36%, more than a third, experienced racism before or doing, during COVID. The CDC report goes on to state that school co connectedness, school connectedness is key to mental health. Uh, so our J4G youth have school connectedness through the program, and they're able to re-engage and re-motivate uh, with their own education. And the program impacts not only outward outcomes, like staying in school and graduating, uh, but it does so by keeping students, uh, youth uh, connected in the school. That's student engagement is absolutely vital. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Maria to give you some examples about how J4NG helps different students. There's a myriad of paths to success, and she will outline three. Uh, Maria Romero, for the record. So we have, I think, we have many, many, many stories to to tell. I. Uh, I was in the classroom with the students for six and a half years before I became the program coordinator. But uh, we have a few that we would like to highlight to you. 
And this talks about you know, all our students, motivating you to reach graduations. I think that's one of the number one uh, priorities of our specialists is to keep the students motivated. Uh, I visit different schools, uh, and the number one thing that I listen from the schools, and the, uh, from the students, said I'm here because I love my class. I love my, uh, my J4NG class, and uh, my specialist really keeps me engaged. So this class is one of uh, those few that keeps me coming to school every day. So because the specialists are not just another teacher, it's a mentor, and sometimes it's the, mom, uh, the mother figure for the students. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about Joseph's, it's a senior. Uh, Joseph's senior year started off a little rough. He was credit deficient uh, and not on track to graduate, and this is the story of a lot of our students. He needed to complete two online classes to be able to make up credits, and we see this in CCSD more and more. Uh, our students are going above and beyond to complete these classes, but successfully they have been uh, doing it, like in, in Joseph's case. Working with his J4NG specialist, Joseph found the motivation to focus on the online courses, completed them both within the first couple weeks, two weeks on the school year, and is now eligible for graduation. Uh, per Joseph, I had a few sleepless nights, but it was worth it. Right now, Joseph is working on getting his uh, ID. We provide that service uh, to continue his life and, head and have a meaningful uh, work and career after graduation. Uh, the second student that we are talking about is we connect you to post-secondary education. That's one of the things also that we focus uh, in helping our students apply for college, scholarships, financial aid. I know it's a struggle and a lot of our families don't have that knowledge. A lot of, especially our Hispanic families, uh, they're the first kids who graduate from high school, so parents don't have that. But we, the specialists, we provide that help for that. We have Lila, Round Mountain High School, class of 2020. She has completed her first year at Great Basin College with a welding certification. This is great to see girls in, in welding. You know, I love it. Uh, and associate's degree. Layla stayed in Elko to complete her bachelor's program during the 2021-2022 school year. Uh, we provide we uh, caring mentor to help youth find a career pathway. That's a specialist, that's a teacher. Uh, we are that mentor to our youth. Uh, one of our students said, I did a thing, is the message J4NG specialist Talia Gaines received, along with a photo of one of her former students working at a construction site. A simple message nearly brought me to tears, she said. We have been working for months to help this student find a career path. I am so happy he's finally seeing results and proud that he persevered through all the challenges that 2020 had to offer. He is now in an apprenticeship program with uh, TAV Contractors Incorporated and has a goal of working in construction and moving up the ranks. And one of the amazing things about uh, J4NG is we don't, we not only support students during uh, high school, we go beyond a whole year after graduation to make sure they receive, uh, you know, the education needed, the support needed to be successful in college, the workforce, whatever pathway they choose, we provide uh, those uh, that information during high school for them to find what it is that they want to do. So we expose them to all of this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. I appreciate that. So as, as you can see, the Jobs for Nevada Graduates Program uh, defines success you know, in, in a variety of ways with regard to what students want to do. Some want to go to post-secondary education. You know, some seek, seek uh, short or midterm training. Uh, and we help them find these multiple pathways. Uh, and our goal, like the language we heard earlier today, is to find, you know, find employment in key industries as much as we can in high demand occupations that pay a livable wage. That is our entire focus we work with. Uh, we've been doing what we call employer engagement for since the beginning of, of the organization. Uh, and I guess they're calling it work-based learning now. But as we sit here today, I can tell you we have 
a group of students from Tonopah who are at Round Mountain Gold doing a tour of the gold mine where many will receive jobs from Tonopah and Round Mountain. Uh, a number of those kids go on and receive MTC scholarships. If you're from uh, Northern, Northern or even from here, you've heard of the MTC scholarship, which completely pays for a welding program, uh, uh, a diesel mechanic program, millwright program at GBC or other places so that they can come back. They're working at the mine, they're making money, and they don't have you know, kind of student debt. So that's one example. Recently, we had a group of students here go to Culinary Training Academy and to, to Nevada Partners. And the focus there was the CTA is focusing on Nevada's jobs of the present, right? Hospitality and gaming. The NPI side is showing jobs of the future with STEM jobs. And that was followed by a panel of people who rose from the ranks as guest room attendants or porters who are now executives at MGM. And they provided a panel about their own unique pathways you know, within the hospitality industry. So that was, there's nothing more impactful for a young person than to actually see a workplace and to see what it's like. So we bring people, we bring employers and training providers in and we take them out there as well. So we're, uh, as it states here, we're a unique statewide and highly effective program. We operate 59 programs. A program is defined as the capacity that a JAG specialist can deliver. So uh, a place like uh, West Wendover High School, which is small, has one specialist you know, serving 45 to 60, sometimes more in rural, sometimes a little less. Uh, and in some places, we have three specialists. For example, Legacy High School, has, you know, which has 3,000 plus students, you know, has three specialists, and they serve about uh, about 200 students combined. So uh, we're in 43 Nevada high schools, and we are in 14 Nevada districts or counties, and we serve roughly 3,400 students, you know, as of now. Uh, each student receives an average of 130 contact hours per year. My my staff corrected me on this. We've raised the level of contact hours from 120 uh, national as a whole has moved to 130 contact hours per student per year, and that's on average. Uh, a J4NG specialist is there for students on good days and bad days. That's why the program works, to help and support students. It isn't a one-shot deal where you go in and you give them a workshop or you, 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 you know, provide them. Basic needs are absolutely essential, but it is that ongoing support and, and provision of, of uh, wraparound services and access to other programs. We work with other programs as well that helps to keep students successful. Uh, we're a multi-year program, like Maria said, and we continue to 12, from 12 to 24 months after graduation. We remain in follow-up, and we measure our outcomes at the end of 12 months. So initially, we only did, national requires that we do 12 months of follow-up. We extended it during COVID because what we found were, was that many young people who had a job lost a job or dropped out of college and they needed uh, to re-engage. So we extended for those that are available but unemployed and not going to school with an additional 12 months to make sure that they connect. Uh, we're replicable and expandable as funding allows to meet educational needs. Uh, and I, like I mentioned here, we were created by the state of Nevada in 2013 to address you know, graduation and workforce issues. Now to talk a little bit about our outcomes, our, our current enrollment, and this is within the high school, is 2,505 students. Uh, the gender breakdown is roughly half and half, 1,291 uh, male and 1,214 female. 77% uh, are eligible for free and reduced lunch. So there are uh, many, many low-income students. In terms of demographics, our students look like Nevada, as does our staff. So 3% of our students are Native American, 41% are Hispanic, 3% are Asian, 28% are white, 14% are African American, 8% are multiracial, and 3% are members of other racial and ethnic groups. And this only accounts for the students in school. It doesn't account for the students who are in follow-up. So this slide gives you a history going back to 2014-15, uh, you know, with regard to the number of schools that we serve, the number of programs, uh, the students on the roster, uh, the students in follow-up, and then carryover for follow-up for second year, and total students. So as you see here, 
back in 2014, 15, you know, we had uh, 22 schools, 22 programs, uh, roughly 824 students that you see here on the right hand column. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, 50 programs in 59 high schools. Incline High School uh, had to end its program this year halfway because we could not find anyone who could afford to live in Incline or commute and deliver the JAG program there. So it was, it was a loss. To the, they have kids in need and poverty there too, and we were unable to, to continue. So for this year, you see a slight decrease from 3377 last year to 3220 this year. So it's, we're trying to get them back and re-engage and move forward. It's been, like I said, a, a, a difficult year, you know, but I anticipate that we will grow to pre-COVID levels and beyond. Uh, this slide is you know, a picture of our tour at CTA. So these are the graduation rates uh, overall and by race and ethnicity or different categories. So the graduation rate for the class of 2020, which was measured 12 months after graduation, was 97%. And that's for all of our JAG seniors, 97% graduate. Uh, a 96% graduation rate for African American and Hispanic. Uh, Caucasian or white students are 99% graduation. Our ELL students, which are not a large number, uh, graduate at a 100% rate. Uh, students with disabilities, 98%. Uh, those with economic disadvantage, or identified as such, have a 97% graduation rate. And multiracial students have a 99% graduation rate. Uh, our outcomes for last year, these are final numbers. Uh, JAG National calls these our five of five. We have five outcomes that we strive for. And as you can see by the green, we hit all five numbers last year. So it starts with graduation rate. Uh, the second one is job placement. Uh, so 69% of our students were uh, placed in jobs or found military enlistment. So that's 69% uh, of the students after graduation. Of those in job placement or military service, 82% were in full-time status. So most of the students that find some form of employment you know, find the need to work full-time. They need to do that, and we help them do it. Full-time positive outcomes, uh, the goal was 75%. We were at 77 um, and what that refers to is a student is working full-time, going to school full-time, you know, post-secondary, or combining both on a full-time basis. Like so many of us did, we worked and went to school. Our young people are doing the same thing. Uh, the last, and this is a, a new measure that we have, uh, is further education rate. We never, I think JAG National never looked, at, really looked at that broken out before by itself. The goal was 35% to start with. We were at 38% last year. Um, which um, this year, as you can see for 2022, the further education rate has risen to 45%. So the numbers I'm showing you now are progress to outcomes this year. This is a moving number through the end of May. Uh, currently at 96% graduation. We're at four or five. We're still one percentage point away from full-time positive outcomes with six weeks, I think five, five and a half weeks to go before the end of the semester. I know we'll get there and, and we'll exceed it, but uh, these are the measures. The, the measures that we look at, we work in the high school, but these are post high school measures, employment, further education, graduation. Um, we have a program called Workforce Pathways, which enhances the work in the JAG classroom. Uh, we were one of four states that got this DOL grant. It included uh, California, Ohio, uh, I'm trying to think of the other one, uh, uh, Michigan and Nevada, uh, who got this Workforce Pathways grant so that we can do uh, really supercharge our efforts on the employer engagement side. So we have enhanced follow up, 12 to 24 months. Uh, the employer engagement experiences that I uh, have described continue, and we continue to try to expand those. Uh, community college, uh, what, what we put in our pacing guide is that we have all of our students uh, apply for FAFSA and apply for a community college, whether they plan to go to or not, because we believe that receiving a, a, a financial aid award and getting an admission letter to a community college 
really enhances the self-esteem and sometimes changes the mind of a student to actually pursue post-secondary education. Uh, and finally, we continue to partner with employers of all kinds uh, to help students enter those, you know, enter those fields, those careers, that kind of thing. And so here, I love the big dump, dump trucks and the gold mines, if you've never been. The classroom, that one is from Round Mountain, and you have a staff member, Sam Fega, talking to the students about careers at the gold mine. Um, the cost per student remains uh, $1,430 per student per year, uh, the investment uh, that is made. And our students receive, like I said, a minimum, and I apologize for the error, 130 contact hours per student per year. And finally, my last slide, we have a proud mom and her son who is in the Manufacturing Development Program Apprenticeship uh, with Tesla last year. Uh, just in closing, we believe that every student has the talent, that they have the capacity to succeed and to contribute and to lift themselves and their families up. Uh, the key to student success is placing more caring adults, more wraparound in the lives of youth, more work. Uh, making education more relevant to the workplace is absolutely essential, and that's what we try to do. And last but not least, we strive to ensure that every student we serve reaches their highest potential. So we're not happy if a student you know, just graduates and you know, goes to work and you know, in retail or something, we really want to help them at least get on the pathway to their highest potential. That's something that we talk about and that we try to live up to as best we can. With that, I will conclude our presentation and I would be glad to, we would be glad to take any questions about jobs for Nevada graduates. Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Samuel and Thomas. Thank you, Chair Dennis, and thank you for the presentation. That was um, pretty spectacular, especially with the graduation rate um, year to be commended. My question is when we were talking about uh, wraparound services and the mental health of our children that go through the program, is there an on-site counselor or are we sending our, our, our children to um, another service. Renee Cantu for the record, and thank you, Assemblywoman Thomas. Uh, currently, we, uh, on the mental health side, we do not have the bandwidth within J4NG to provide the service. We have had conversations about adding a social worker position uh, to help us parachute in where we're needed. At this point in time, we work with the school district and also we're, uh, what do you call it, the people who identify when someone is in crisis. We let the, the school know and refer them to mental health services at the schools. That said, uh, a lot of those services are insufficient and so I think we need to do more and, and we would love to see our schools do more. Uh, on the mental health front when there is crisis. What we do do as, as, as an organization is kind of that mentorship and oversight, but when it comes to you know, professional psychological services, we have to defer to the professionals, and we do. All right, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Do we have any questions up north? No, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, some, some, Assemblywoman Hardy, any questions? Okay. All right, thanks. Um, great work. I, I always love to hear the great things that are going on and to hear about those students. And, you know, that I remember the first time I went to one of the JAG, uh, I think it was at like Desert Pines High School or something. And just to see the kids, I mean, this is when you were first starting and the kids that were, I mean, they were ready to drop out and, and this program kind of helped them turn that around. So this is a, a great work that you're doing. So I appreciate you coming and, and, and sharing your success and, and helping us see uh, these great things that are going on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very quickly, I did include in, in the packet that I gave each of you uh, a list of our 87 competencies uh, so that you can see what we teach in the classroom. It's a, it's a national curriculum. I also included a list of the high schools that we're in by team. So if you want to know where J4NG is and isn't, this will help you. And uh, a quick one pager that has uh, our outcomes and some stories as well. Thank you so much. We wish you all a wonderful afternoon and appreciate 
are thankful for the opportunity to present to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. All right, so we'll close that item out and we will go to our next item, which is, make sure I get the right one. Um, item number, number nine. And we have um, Dr. Moore, I think is gonna be at least starting it out and if he'll introduce it, all the other ones that are presenting. Good afternoon again, Chair Dennis, Vice Chair Bilbrey Axelrod, and honorable members of the committee. I'm Dr. Jonathan Morris, I was the Deputy Superintendent for Student Achievement at the Nevada Department of Education. I am joined here in Carson City by my colleague Dave Brandkamp, who serves as the Director of our Office of Standards and Instructional Support. The Office of Standards and Instructional Support at the Department provides support and professional learning for the implementation of Nevada's academic content standards. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to uh, Director Brandkamp. Thank you, Dr. Moore, uh, Chair Dennis, members of the committee, and Dave Brandkamp for the record. I'm the director of our Standards and Structural Support Office, and we're going to take you through a little history and where we are planning to go with the, the standards going forth. I believe everybody can see the slides. So, so why are these important? Our standards basically set the expectations of what our students should know and be able to do by the end of each school year. It's very important that our standards are as cl clear and a set a measurable goal, set us up that our, stand or our instructional materials then would have high quality aligned to these standards and rigorous for our students and an opportunity to learn the knowledge and skills and applications as they move forth. In the NRS, you'll notice that at the bottom of the slide, it does say how we are be able to work with our districts on that and be able to share that information going forth. At this time, I want to take you through a little bit of the history of where our standards and how that started. Next slide. In 1997, the legislative group formed the Council to Establish the Academic Standards. This group then asked and worked with the department to start the process of forming standards for the state of Nevada for the first time. In 97, committees were formed to look at English language arts, math, and science. By 1998, those standards were able to be brought forth to first the councils to establish academic standards and then to the state board on August 18th of 1998 for those, those three content areas. With that time, there was also support being built as to what was needed for the districts. In 1999, a big year for all the rest of the standards were brought forth. So social studies, health, PE, fine arts, integrated technology, and foreign languages, those committees were brought forth and those standards were also developed. And during that time, support was also being given to the LEAs around math science, and ELA. As we look at those next years, so I won't take you through each little spot, but from 2000 to 2005, all those eight areas were then brought forth to the ELAs and support was given to them to help bring those to our teachers and then out to the students. As with anything, standards are dynamic. They change over time. So starting in 2006, we've started the revision of the math standards. In 2007, science was brought back for their revisions and support continued throughout the state in both those areas as well as the previous standards. 2008 saw the first revision of social studies and ELA. And again, through 2009, the support for those now four areas as we were revising them, plus the others that had existed, continued throughout the state. In 2010, a big year for all of us, we remember that is when the Common Core was brought forth. So both English language arts and mathematics were adopted with the Common Core as its base. In 2011, the support around those began. And it's important to note as, as standards are brought forth and brought to our ELAs, the districts after the adoption 
occurs at the state level have an entire year in which to work with their folks and developing and changing any curriculum. That is why the supports are listed out for us. In 2012, foreign language was brought forth and you can notice, because if you were on their department going, I don't see that word anymore, they're now referred to as world languages. So that committee brought us forth the changes not only in those standards, but also its, its change to what was more accepted. During that time, we continued the support around with the work with ELA and math. And at that time, too, was in 2013, we saw the first set of where those standards were aligned to what we refer to now as the Smarter Balance or SBAC assessments. By 2014, physical education was brought forth for revision and science was also revised in their adoption with the next generation science standards. The following year, both of those obviously received the necessary support in those changes. And then in 16, the continuation of all those areas, because that was quite a bit of change that had occurred, the support was done. Note that also the support is being given by our regional professional development programs around the state. In 2017, the exciting piece, because I know some members of this committee were part of that, we brought forth computer science for the first time to the state of Nevada. So those were new set of standards for the first time in 2017. 2018, the social studies standards were brought forth, and in which case we saw some additions brought to them in the areas of financial literacy and multicultural area. At the same time, fine arts were brought forth and revised in 2018. 2019, because we already had the integrated technology standards, we then brought those forth, were revised and integrated with our computer science since they worked closely together on those. And then in 2020, our health standards, this is the most recent set of standards that were brought forth for revisions and were adopted at that point. During the pandemic, during 21, 22, the support to those were done and now added on were all the digital support as we went and many of our students were working in either a hybrid or a different form. So how to support those standards in its new form. I'd like to share with you about the process of how we go through this adoption and the necessary sets to bring forth what the students need to know, making sure a couple things at the bottom just want to highlight that these are developmentally appropriate, promote the skills necessary, as you've heard all day from various groups about the importance for our students to be ready for higher education, but also business and industry as to what is needed to be successful in those areas. On the next slide, very busy slide, a lot of information here. We often want to just make sure we keep a note that the standards are what the students need to know, the curriculum is how, and then the instruction is left to our experts and professionals in the field as the teachers as how they adjust and work with that necessary curriculum. When we take standards from the very beginning, even with any of the revisions, what starts first is a request by the department to the council to establish academic standards to review a given content area. Some of that may have been directed by a change brought forth from legislation, such as was done with financial literacy and multicultural, but that is where our beginning phases start. It also starts a green flag for our team back in my office to do some prep work of the selection and application for the review committee because the department themselves do not write the standards. This is done by a statewide committee. We take a look at the same time of what other standards may exist in other states, as well as what may be happening at a national level that could drive or give us information to make any necessary revisions if the committee so chooses. The committee then is brought together. They take a look of what has been brought forth or what they may have heard as well, and make a decision as to what is needed to be either revised added or a possible even rewrite of the, of the given standards. Those take a couple months usually to get through that process as you could well imagine to cover all the standards from K through 12th grade. Once that is done, the standards are then released to the public, posted on the department's website, shared with as many people as possible that we have connections to and our stakeholders for 30 days to receive any comments from them on what they see 
maybe there's questions, something they don't understand, um, so that we can respond back. Those comments are collected by my staff member who's in charge of the given content area, and they bring it back to the committee to go through and make either further adjustments or clarity to what was brought forth by the public. At that point, we are then at the position to bring forth these standards for adoption. They first go to this council to establish academic standards for their review, any questions that may be brought forth at that point. And if they are acceptable of what we have brought forth, they then make the recommendation to bring that to the state board, in which case the same group will bring that presentation to the Nevada State Board and ask for the adoption of those standards. It's important at that point, once we've done, I've heard uh, Senator Dennis appreciate your support through the years on this, as those are what we want to release is our teacher-friendly language so they can start that process. That begins the process then for the districts and us along with the RPDPs to what needs to do to help support these changes, what needs to change in the curriculum. Just a quick set so you can see the set, the state standards there, uh, working from a health perspective there. There's an example of a code and what might be given to them. A district may have selected, for example, Glencoe Teen Health to match that given uh, standard. And as you can see, what the teacher could choose to do is they read chapter two of that text and then work on different ways they pro progress and achieve the personal health goal created from that previous class. So you can see how they get down to the fine details with our professionals in the field. It's important that we have a lot of resources, obviously, with all these changes. So thank you to my incredible staff and the RPDP and the teachers out there. There are often sets of whether there's pedagogical or content webinars given. Since we are in April, I'll make note today, this is the month for financial literacy, so we've had monthly work around financial literacy. The Read by Grade 3 team works with the literacy specialists. In fact, the digital learning guide was re released recently just to support all the digital learning. If anybody's available, Saturday is a presentation, a summit on digital learning, so we welcome any of you to that. There's also conferences, summits uh, that we share this work um, on a regular basis. There could be workshops that are given out to within the districts, work with our curriculum directors from each of our districts and the, and the charter schools, sharing even virtual book studies, as well as what could be posted on podcasts, Twitters, blogs, or you can see things that are on our website that may be available. On the next side, because that's the first step, is the adoption of our standards then becomes what adoption of material to support what comes forth. We have recently gone through a revision with our partners of West Ed to help streamline the process and make it easier for all of us, including our LAAs, to go through this. We are in the first part of sending this out in, in its final form to be adopted or drafted and, and shared by everybody at the end of this month with the projected idea that by June 2022 we can start back with the adoption process with our board. To share with you just an idea, an RFQ is left out with uh, to all the vendors so they know what material we're looking for in a given area. They'll submit that to the department. My staff, depending on their content area, that would then look through the material and make a uh, quick look of is it fitting all the things that we asked for in the um, RFQ. At that point, they bring forth a similar committee that we had for the standards adoption process to evaluate and rate the mat given material on two areas that the state is, it will check. One is its alignment to our content standards and two, an equitable and access um, for all our students. If that meets all those, it is then moved forth to my colleague to my right here, Dr. Moore, and the, our cabinet members to make another check to make sure we are set, at which point we then take this forth to the state board um, for their adoption and post it on our website. The goal of that is then our LEAs could have a list of in their, each given content area of certain material that now they can make their selection of what would support best the work in their given areas. 
On the next page, you'll see what is the proposed to get us online and back. Um, you can see the computer science, social studies, and world language are set as we are going through this process. They are doing their final checks now so that we can bring this forth to our state board, hopefully by June to July, as you can see there. So we can have that material set. And then you'll notice that English language arts, fine arts would be in the next iteration next year and the following year to catch us up, health, PE, and math would come forth so that we can bring our, all our districts enough material that align to the standards, but matches and ready for their um, use inside the, their system. With that, you'll have just another one just so you have an idea of going through the future. We'll spread that out a little bit. Um, that's a lot to play catch up, but we want to make sure everyone has adequate and necessary materials in front of them. Starting in June of 24, we'll start back with social studies and then work our way back through each of the standards, trying no more than two of our content areas in a year because our stakeholders who do this review are quite often the teachers and parents, public that may need to be at meetings and that's a tax for them, especially for our are, so we look through the needs that we've already heard all day of the demands on the system. And finally, a sheet that I think most of us have seen, at least I know I have for years, is here's the plan let forth at this point given time of where the standards and their revisions would come forth as what we would ask our ac council to establish academic standards so that people can see what is the set um, plan as we move forth with the potential. Remember, keep in mind that each time we bring our committee together, that's why it has the term next to it, is that they can look at them, make a determination as they review, do we need to make adjustments? As we work our way through, and if you'll notice, the very year after the develop and adopt is that curriculum adjustment that I was referencing earlier. So at this point, both Dr. Moore and I are here if you have any questions on how we adopt our standards or the history that went with them. Okay, so we're at questions. Any questions? I'm not seeing anyone here with any questions. Chair you did a Dennis. pretty good job at explaining it. Yes. Chair, I, I have a couple of questions, if, if you would indulge. Sure, go ahead. Yep. Okay, thank Please. you. Thank you for being here. Nice to hear the presentation. Um, actually, the last subject of the day is something that I've, uh, is really near and dear to my heart. And so I've got a few questions, and then I, I actually have a question. I'm not sure if you can answer, but maybe um, if there's some district officials listening. I believe that standards, curriculum, and proficiency are at the heart of what I really care about, and I'm, I'm sure for you as well. Um, and as I, we went through the presentation and looked at you know, the implementation of all these different curric, um, standards over the years, in particular, we've had co Common Core for 12 years now. The problem I'm having, and again, I understand that you set the standards, you're not in charge of the curriculum, nor are you in charge of the proficiency rates. My biggest concern is our proficiency rates. Um, I have no doubt our standards are, are good, but when I, I just happened to stumble across this statistic doing something else this week, and I came across the proficiency standard of a high school in my neighborhood, um, but then I went on to look so I could get a sample um, of a few different uh, um, geographical locations. Um, I saw at Edward C. Reed High School in Sparks, Nevada, where I, where I live, the, per, the graduation rate is 91%, but the proficiency in math is 26%, and the reading proficiency is 39%. Then I jumped over to Elko, which is now part of my district, not where the high school is, but part of the county. The graduation rate there is 92%, but their math proficiency is 20%. Their reading proficiency is 42%. Then I did one last one. Then I jumped down to Clark County to Centennial High School. The graduation rate is 93%. Math is 23%. 
reading is 49. So I'm, I'm hoping somebody can answer how we have these kind of graduation rates with such low proficiency rates, well below 50% um, in very important subjects. So first, that's the first question, is how do we align that graduation rate with those proficiency rates? Jonathan Moore, for the record, uh, thank you, Assemblywoman, uh, for the question. I think when it comes to the analysis of proficiency rates, we know that there are many variables that impact uh, the proficiency rates. Uh, first, I'll preface by saying the proficiency rate that we reference is taken from the portrait in time, in this case, the summit of assessment that we as a state administer. And so that's where that rate comes from. But when we compare that to um, what goes into a graduation rate, there are many variables outside of the summit of assessment by which a student is able to demonstrate mastery um, of a content or a subject area. And so I think when we talk about some of the differences, I think that's part of the explanation. One, the multiple ways in which a student can demonstrate mastery beyond one indicator. Uh, that's something that we're talking about as a state as we're implementing competency-based education, for example. But I think that would be the clearest explanation if you were to equate the two and then look at them parallel. When it comes to graduation rates, that is the culmination of all of the activities that a student is engaged in and all the opportunities they may have to demonstrate mastery toward a content area or a subject. Whereas that proficiency rate that we reference for accountability purposes is taken from the one period in time, and in our case, the administration of our summative assessment. Uh, so that still is not to say that there aren't gaps. Uh, in between the two, we have students who may not have attained proficiency. Um, on that particular measure, but who may be graduating, I think that gets at the heart of also why instructional materials are important. So when we talk about all of the indicators that comprise a student's learning experience, having high quality instructional materials that are aligned to standards, that are not only rigorous, but that are accessible. And I think that's one of the indicators that can certainly be strengthened um, that in our work with WestEd is what we're doing, is how do we ensure that the instructional materials that are being selected locally um, not only are rigorous, not only aligned to standards, but are accessible. And so that includes our English learners, our students with disabilities. Um, that includes across multiple learning modalities. So how do instructional materials account for students who may be visual learners, students who may be kinesthetic in their learning? And so I think all of those factors um, play a role in contributing to some of the differences you noted, uh, but also explaining how we could maybe decrease uh, that gap um, based on the differences you noted. Thank you for that. And Chair, if I might follow up. Yes, go ahead. Um, and, and I appreciate that explanation. I, I'm trying to keep this to, um, for my constituents to understand at the, you know, they, they're not immersed in all the acronyms that we are, are diluged with as we serve on an education committee. They're, they're not uh, schooled in the bureaucracy of, of it all. So for them to understand, perhaps when they go to the Nevada Department of Education portal, which I've encouraged my constituents to do when they reach out to me, those those statistics, I don't have them in front of me, but I've quoted them before, those talk about not necessarily, we'll, we'll use the word proficiency, but I'm gonna do, use it very broadly, reading at grade level. If I'm not mistaken, that's what NDE puts up on the site, which is very helpful. So I'm not, if we wanna get rid of the word proficiency, reading at grade level, those reading statistics are frightening. They are, if, I, if my memory serves me right, almost consistently, a third of our populations in various counties, in various parts of the state, are reading at grade level, a third. So um, I guess I, I'm, I'm honored to serve on this committee. I think we have really, I know that you're all dealing with in the trenches the teachers are, the school districts are, and, and these numbers, a lot of the ones I reference in my prior comments on the record have been pre-COVID. So we can't use COVID, COVID has compounded how scary these numbers are. Um, and so um, I just hope as we review in 2023 the standards for math 
and then 2024 for Eng English language arts um, that we are taking into consideration maybe not proficiency, but reading at what grade level, math at the grade level. Um, because then when we get into graduation, we look at remediation rates, you know, we know that these students are not, 50% of them in Nevada are not prepared to go on to college level math and reading. So uh, in my view, we are in a crisis. And um, I'm here to help, I'm here to listen, um, I appreciate the work you do, and as was mentioned earlier by um, Dr. Uh, Stevens, I think, we can't be, all be in silos, and I'll do my part, um, and I hope that we can find a way to find a way to fix this gap, because uh, at this rate, these, these uh, grade level uh, uh, proficiency or reading at grade level is, is just not not cutting the mustard, and our consti my constituency is extremely alarmed by it. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I was going to ask, um, can you talk a little bit about AB 19, where that dealt with standards, and how that's how that fits into all of this? Jonathan Moore for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so Assembly Bill 19, uh, there were sort of two, um, two tracks uh, to that bill. The first one was the removal of academic standards from regulations. So referencing the chart that Director Brandcamp previously talked about where you saw the orange boxes and the flow, um, of academic standards from the time in which we engage to revise them through the time in which they're actually approved by the state board and ready to enter classrooms. There used to be another step in there that required the standards to be approved through regulation. And so as you can imagine, the time that it took for the standards to be approved by the state board and then to be codified in regulation caused a delay um, from when they then were able to reach classrooms or reach our teachers in the classrooms. So one of the things that AB 19 did was it removed the requirement to have them codified in regulation. So now, once standards are adopted by the State Board of Education, they're able to begin to transition, school districts and schools are be able to begin the transition uh, to implementation in the classrooms. So that was the first aspect of AB 19. Uh, the second aspect of AB 19 uh, was, in essence, an update um, to uh, how we defined um, the course of U.S. government, economics. Am I missing one? Yes, changing um, changing U.S. government uh, to include to be inclusive of civics um, as well as um, economics, and so those were the two changes um, through AB 19. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much. We appreciate the presentation. It's uh, definitely helpful as we go through all this for everybody to understand. I know that the standards, as you already had, um, talked about, um, they've been around a long time um, when we first initiated these. Um, uh, and so to see where we're at, and it's good to get an update on that. So thank you very much. All right, with that, we are now going to go to our last item, on, well, second to last item on the agenda, item number 10, public comment. Um, we'll start here in Las Vegas. Um, so if you're wishing to, we do have one coming forward here. Uh, if you are in Carson City, wish to uh, give public comment there, go ahead and, and go up to the thing, and I'll, we'll come back up there after we're done here in Las Vegas. Thank you. Good afternoon. Mr. Chairman, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over... 120 years. Violence in school safety was not on the committee agenda today, but we know the horrific event at Del El Dorado High School has been on all of our minds. Vicki Crydell, teacher and president of the NEA of Southern Nevada, said this, the young woman who was attacked, her life will never be the same. You can't cross your fingers and hope for the best. What happened shows that's not going to work. They haven't done enough. Whatever talks have happened, it's not enough. It's too late for committees. It's too late for town halls. The high-profile recent events are not new 
not limited to Clark County or the 2013 shooting at Sparks Middle School, which took the life of teacher Michael Lansbury. NSEA has consistently heard alarming concerns about personal safety from our members across the state. That's why we have a long history of engagement on the issue of educator safety and student disciplinary practice. NSEA spearheaded the creation of the Progressive Student Discipline System decades ago, and during the 2019 session, we were the only stakeholder group raising public concerns during the discussion of implementing restorative justice in AB 168. Here's some of our public comment from that 2019 hearing. Unfortunately, there has been an increase in violence against educators in Nevada and across the United States. In 2016, 6% of teachers reported being physically attacked by a student from their school in the previous year. NSEA and our local affiliates have received numerous reports this year of assaulted educators with bruises, broken bones, not to mention the emotional toll. We believe that a strong restorative discipline system would reduce incidents where educators sustain injuries. However, the system needs to be proactive, implemented district-wide, district and will require much greater attention and significant new resources that are not reflected in AB 168. Without this level of implementation, we fear that moving away from the no-tolerance policies could result in even less safety. Reduction of suspensions and expulsions is a laudable goal, but not at the expense of safety for violent offenses. Last interim, NSEA proposed an Educator Bill of Rights to this committee to improve educator safety. Our proposal was largely disregarded. Since the pandemic, the situation in schools seems to have deteriorated further. A delayed and poor statewide implementation of 168 has left many schools and school districts unsure about the student discipline system, opting for little to no student discipline at all. The pandemic has exacerbated mental health issues and an historic educator shortage with thousands of vacant positions across the state, in addition to the structural shortage with the largest class sizes in the country, makes it nearly impossible to implement even the best plans for school safety and student discipline. NSEA's Time for 20 campaign would address many of the underlying issues of the educator shortage and go a long way to improve school climate and culture, but meaningful resources for student mental health and a real investment in the implementation of restorative justice system are long overdue. Educators across the state and our students need this bold action now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? We don't have anyone else here. Let's go to Carson City. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to give public comment? No, there's no one here. No, thank, you, no here. thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. Um, BPS, could we go online, see if there's anyone wishing to give public comment? Thank you, Chair. The public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Okay. Um, usually, I would say when we only did online, then we we had a little bit of a delay. But since we've actually started public comment, I think uh, they probably had enough time to get on if they wish to uh, give comment. Um, that is our um, um, the end of item number ten, public comment. Um, just want to thank everybody um, who was here today, all of our presenters, to the members. Um, and uh, our, an archived version of today's meeting it will be available online. Our next meeting is currently scheduled for Wednesday, May 18th. Um, with that, thank you all for being here today. Appreciate staff and all the work that they do. Um, and with that, we are adjourned.